There's no time. What's up, everybody? It's episode 148. Yeah. Now, on this one, you know how for a while I was kind of like, you know, doing true crime one week and then paranormal stuff that uh, the next week? That's kind of what we're doing today. Um, so I was going to say that this is probably going to be like, oh, it's kind of a more paranormal show because it's about purported demon possessions. And so it'll be more fun. But then yeah. the second case we're going to talk about, not so fun. Well, it's true crime also. This is paranormal and true crime. Same, yeah. Same cool episode. Stuff. Uh, At least the second case is. Yeah, evidently dude got possessed and did all kinds of screwed up stuff, you know, involved some eating somebody's face kind of, kind of like Florida man down here who took Flocka and uh, ate other, got naked with the other dude and ate his face off in front of the hospital. Like you do. That was That's a party. That's how you do it in Florida, yeah. Now, that was the one that was on the uh, security footage, yes. Yeah, you couldn't see it happen. You just saw him down in between the dividers, had those uh, concrete dividers keep... Uh, Traffic from, you know, hitting one another in the oncoming lane. It's out yeah. in front of the uh, That's right. I remember hospital. that. Yeah, they got down in there. They were naked. <laughs> yeah. Flock, I don't know why Flock does weird things to the mind. They I started, guess so. They started fighting and dude ate the other guy's face. <laughs> then there were reported zombies, you know. Zombie, I was going to yeah. say, I remember all the jokes about Yeah, zombie it. jokes. Here's the zombie invasion, finally. Dude lived, too. The guy who got his face eaten, he lived. Oh God. He was a bum. Like, yeah. Yeah, it was a bomb. Two bombs. That's what I mean. It's like, you know, it's bad enough that you're, like, homeless and you probably have yeah. a shitty life. And then some dude comes along on Flocka, chews your face off, and then you got to live your rest of your bum life. They were both high on Flocka. Your face fucking chewed off. I think they were both high on Flocka last time. They ever got high together on Flocka. If you guys don't know what Flocka is, Flocka, you can, okay, just, just go on YouTube and just type in Flocka. And you'll see, it just, it just makes people do the weirdest shit. All kinds of fun Kind of makes it repeat the same things over and over again. It's like, what? What? <laughs> what? Well, it seems It makes you dance. Yeah, time. yeah. It's, it's just, <laughs> it, it's real cheap. I, I, I heard so. that it came in like potpourri and bath salts. They sell them in those, you know, see, ghetto now, drug stores. They sneak it in and you buy bath salts and I, I guess you smoke it. See, but that guy, here's the thing, though, and I don't, like, please correct me if I'm wrong, because it's not like I've, like, kept up with this news story yeah. or anything, but I thought, like, I remember hearing about it, because everyone was like, ooh, zombie apocalypse, this is how it starts, it's just like the beginning of Walking yeah. Dead, like, one dude eating some other dude's face yeah. off, and everyone just makes a joke about it, but I thought that they determined later on that drugs were not involved. Because I remember thinking, huh, that makes it, like, a hundred times more mysterious, well, because I think, why the fuck? I think, I think, from my understanding, drugs were not detected. But you can't detect Flocka, evidently. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, I think that's I thought what you could it. pretty much detect. Yeah, well, you know, all you probably, the drugs. You could probably detect it if you have Flocka, but I don't think you can detect if somebody took it or not. If somebody took it or this, not. Yeah, the last I heard, it was Flocka. Yeah, I don't know. Like I said, yeah. I haven't kept up with that. When you were talking about like so eating somebody's face off, I was yeah. thinking about that poor woman that had that pet chimpanzee that flipped out and chewed her friend's face off, and that woman lived also. Yeah. Cause so you know, it chewed like I said, fingers off. It chewed a bunch everything. of stuff off. Yeah. God. He and was that, mad. That chimp was mad, man. Well, clearly. Yeah. And my and and you know, don't get me wrong. I love apes and monkeys and stuff. I've even read. I read the biography of Nim Chimpsky, the very famous little chimpanzee that was on Sesame Street, like back in the seventies and stuff. And as much as I love them, and people were all, uh, they were all like cool about that. That's like, not having the truth of chimpanzees, pet. though. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, all these people were like, oh, you know, we can raise it with a kid. And no. All this, which you can until they're about five yeah. or six, if it's yeah. a male. Male. Um, they will just flip out and just tear your arms ma out of their Male sockets. chimpanzees are, are, are demons, basically. They're yes. demonic. They're cute when they're little, yeah. and they're human-like when they're little. But they once get, the males get to... Remember that I Shouldn't Be Alive episode about that guy went down there, an American guy went down there to hang out with his... Hang out with his African friend who was yes. like, Yes. And they got attacked by that chimpanzee. They'll, and they'll that tear black your dude, testicles right off. That black dude jumped right in between those two dudes. And that, that chimpanzee basically just ate that black dude right in front of him. 
Yeah. Just, you know. And, and, and that white dude said that, that to look into the face of that chimpanzee, so it was like looking into the face of a demon. Yeah, they're mean. They're just, yeah. Particularly the males, and particularly, I think, yeah. I believe once they get about eight years old. Yeah. As I said, up until then, I mean, they're a handful, obviously, but some people have uh, raised them or kept them as pets, you know, when they were younger than that. But once they reach that age, particularly males, yeah, you, you, know, you, you we, can't keep them in your house. You anymore. know what it's like to see something that makes you mad, and you go, Yah! you know what I mean? Right? Well, well, yeah. When a chimp does that, I mean, it's it's like tenfold. Well, and they're so like imagine. five times stronger than a person. Actually, that's a myth. Did you know that? Is it? Yeah, it's a myth. There, I, I looked into that. All right, because you know, I was, maybe I was wishing I had chimpanzee strength. You know, <laughs> turns out that they were saying they I was were like you get you. that whole thing that they were five times stronger than 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 the average male kind of came from the early 1900s when there wasn't much physical fitness. In, in people. <laughs> when everyone people just had noodle arms. Yeah, people didn't wait, work out. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, you know, in, in a situation like that, you put a lot of muscle on a small frame. You know, yeah, you it has get a your lot ass of, kicked by a chimpanzee. Yeah, and it, it, they have a lot of leverage because their, their bones aren't very long, you know, compared to a human, and they're, they're kind of compact. And they'll jump on a late Victorian, early 20th century man and just tear him the fuck up. And but, his monocle will go flying. Yeah, his top yeah. hat will go flying in the opposite direction. But when you really there go his spats. But when you really test, <laughs> when you really test a male chimpanzee pound for pound, you get him to try, to try to do certain things like you know bench press or whatever, lift certain weights. They're actually just uh, you know pound for pound about as about as uh, strong as a as a guy who works out. But they'd probably still kick most people's asses. Yeah, yeah. And but like pound I for said, pound, they're. Now, there's a rage factor, though, too. Well, that's you know what I, mean? I was just going to yeah, say. Yeah, when adrenaline and stuff kicks in. They don't have any concept no. of like, oh, I shouldn't do this, or I'm going right. to go to jail, or They'll anything. They'll hurt themselves, too. They don't give one single shit no. about that. No, no. And they have teeth. They can bite. They have a, you know, they, they, they their bite force is a lot more than a human. And they do a lot of damage with biting. They'll bite a hand off. Yeah. A human can't do that. But when it comes to moving things with, like, their upper body and picking things up and that then things they're about as strong as a strong man yeah you know although like i said it's probably their their bite that is up because i've i yeah. mean i've seen grown men get fucked up by a dog that oh, was yeah. like that was you know oh that, yeah. that was really head up to get in there. oh man like a 20 or 20 pound <laughs> a 20 pound bobcat will just fuck you up that's what i mean you so know? it's like yeah. it doesn't have they don't have to be no. bigger than you or nothing no. like that they just have to have a strong bite and sharp claws mm -hmm. but in it with a chip they got a strong bite force they're as strong as a strong man, and they don't have a filter. And when they're pissed, yeah, like that's I said, it. they're not yeah. worried about going to prison or no. anything like that. No, and I just think that rage kicks in. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, a, a person when a person becomes enraged, they can get very strong. Yeah, they have. Or for, yeah, you know, chimpanzees have anger issues. Yeah, that's what it is. It's very funny how we went off on this whole <laughs> tangent about chimpanzees. Yeah. Your face. Well, just because the second case that we're talking about. It might, it's gonna, it's gonna alert, might include some of this. Shit. Someone does get their face yeah, and torn off. Not by a chimpanzee, though. By you a hear person. a lot of this pedestrian talk about, oh, man, a person who's ang angry or, you know, that's a sign of weakness and shit like that. And, oh, you know, don't, don't give in to anger, you know, like that's something out of Star Wars. No. Mm. Guys that train for combat, train for physical strength, enhance anger and rage. That's how you get strong. When you're lifting weights, you got to get mean. You get mad. And you will push yourself, you know what I mean, and uh, harder. And I think it, it releases a lot of um, hormones that are kind of like performance-enhancing drugs. Because, you know, guys that are constantly mad and pissed off and work out get big. Yeah. Yeah, they become war machines. Yeah. So... If you want to get big and you want to get fierce, you can't be Gandhi. You know what I mean? They're not like that. <laughs> but yeah, well, uh, yeah. you know, j like I said, we're going to talk about that in the second half of the show, The this case. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with working out. It doesn't have anything no. to do with anything like that. But about getting mad and getting mean and getting demonic and demonically possessed, it's about that. Or so he said. Yeah. But, uh, well, crazy people can do it too. It's like a crazy strength. It's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. 
You know what I mean? Now, um, both of these cases, I talked about both of these cases in my Poltergeist book, which was called The Unseen Hand. They were in the demonic possession section. Now I'm going to say, like, right from the jump, I do not believe in demonic possession. Um, If something, like, quote-unquote paranormal is going on with these people, uh, I think it's probably some kind of, like, like I said, some misidentified, like, poltergeist energy type type of shit. Which is, or the uh, person's just crazy. Right, and for any new viewers, and we've already talked about this before, James written a book about it. I, I've kind of experienced it myself, and um, out-of-body experiences also. Um, uh, poltergeist is commonly, you know, misattributed to ghosts. It does. It is a ghostly type phenomenon, but it's it's actually RSPK, which is recurrent psych, you know, recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. Uh, I know psychokinesis exists. I've seen it. It's just, I don't really know what it is. Yeah, and like I said, I think that in cases of demonic possession, I think that it's people, like I said, it's either people with mental illnesses uh, in the case of just someone behaving badly, um, or if there are other things going on, like... Strong emotions. Levitations or shit like that, then I think that's RSPK coming from the focus individual, but interpreted through a demonic possession lens, because usually it's people that are uh that are already believers just like like the uh the case that inspired the exorcist yeah uh which was what was he called robbie Mannheim or yeah. roland doe or whatever they call I saw him. interviews his, uh they, they never like gave his real name but they i saw interviews with uh one of the guys that assisted on that and he was a priest and he was convinced it was rspk he didn't yeah and it. it sounds like that to me yeah and jenny's seen it, it it's not as when you actually see it happen as an adult, you know, it's not as disturbing as you actually would think it would be. It didn't actually scare me yeah. when I saw it. I just thought it was kind of neat. Like I didn't like I didn't really believe it at first. Like well, you were th- I didn't believe that I had seen it at first. Yeah, you see it, and you can't believe you've seen it, and then you go, but "Oh yeah, yeah, kind, it happened." Yeah, yeah, but it was kind of it, it wasn't like this big spectacular. You know, it's kind of like a mundane thing. Like oh, well, remote jumped off the coffee table. Yeah, it's like oh, there, there, yeah. that is that and that some, happened. Nobody yeah, touched that. Right. So that was pretty weird. But it didn't scare me. I just thought it was kind of cool. Yeah, that was very minor. Yeah. You, know, you can go back and look at Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist. That's my full story right there for any of you new listeners. Yeah. Um. But, you know, there are other guys that it's happened to. Girls, Janet Hopskin, Hodgkins. Hodgson. From, Hodgson, that's her name. From, um, uh, well, Enfield Poltergeist. And also, um, the guy I want to have on one of these days, the Rain Man. Yeah. He's in prison right Don now. Don Decker. Don Decker. He's in prison. I thought he was out again. He might be out by now. That was just for arson, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that was, you know... His boss wanted him to burn the place That's down. That's what I mean. More so, like insurance fraud. So I figure he's probably out right Yeah, now, because it, that was a long time ago. He had uh, an ability to kind of go into a trance and make it rain in, yeah. indoors. Just and he said that rain. he could control it, yeah. which is unusual. Yeah, very unusual. And he could also um, kind of throw himself against walls. And uh, somebody saw him get, get just kind of picked up by an invisible force and thrown. So there's psychokinesis involved in that, too. Yeah. And the cops, you know, the police were involved in that when the cops saw rain going sideways. And when he was in prison the first time, it was raining in his cell. And the damn warden, you know, had weird stuff happen to him. And the guards were scared of him. And they brought in an exorcist to come and, uh, I guess, counsel him. Did it, they did an exorcism on him, and the raining stopped. That's a, Donnie Decker was a very good case. Strange story, and uh, man, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to get him on. He's he seems like a very interesting person. Like yeah. all of the interviews I've seen of him. Yeah, I gotta try to find him. Yeah, I'll maybe try to find maybe him. we should. We He's should. probably out by now. Because I wrote about him in my book too. Yeah, but like I said, uh, I decided to put these two cases together just because. <coughs> excuse me, just because they were both purported cases of demon possession. As I said, the first one we'll kind of do is like a teaser. Um, you know, which was just kind of like a pretty standard uh, possession. It's just it was interesting because it was attested to by an actual, like, psychiatrist and someone who'd been to, like, Yale and shit like that who actually did believe that it had occurred and that there was a lot of witnesses and stuff. And uh, then uh, after the break, we'll talk about the really fucked up one, which a couple of people have actually asked me 
to do. Yeah, so and, we're getting around to it. Yeah, right? and since I wrote about it in my book, I said, yeah, why not? So I decided we'd put these two together. Is there any business we got to talk talk about? Yeah, we got a couple of shout-outs this week, okay. so let's uh, do that before we get into the main topic. Uh, first thing, I wanted to thank Melanie for her PayPal donation. She gives us PayPal donations uh, pretty yeah. frequently, and it is always very much appreciated. Yeah, so it's always a very you. generous sum. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you yeah. very much, uh, Melanie. Also, we have a, a patron named Dwayne who actually increased his support um, up to the $20 level. So he will also be getting a I'm t-shirt. I'm going to send you a shirt, man. Which is another thing uh, that yeah. we've been talking about. Yeah. Also, if you didn't see on our Patreon page, we do. Um, if you're underneath the $20 tier, um, you still are. We, we put all your names in a little We mug. did a drawing, yeah. And we did a drawing, um, so one of you wins a t-shirt, and this time around, uh, we do them quarterly, this time yeah. around, our patron Ashley won yeah. a t-shirt, so she will be getting a t-shirt as I'll well. I'll on that too. I'm just waiting on one thing to actually execute the shirts, but by the time you're seeing this, they may be done. Yeah, we have pretty we have pretty much everything. We have the screens, we have um, the, the what do you call it, the photo emulsion, we have all the stuff. I want a photo hardener, and I want this little plate that'll help me apply. Yeah, that's, and that's coming in a couple of yeah. days. And then I'm just waiting for uh, most of our, I think I have eight people like got back to me so far with their sizes. Yeah. Um, so if you are a $20 and up patron and you have not got back to me yet with your sizes, please do that. Please do that as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, because that will, you know, we, we want to get the shirts sent out before yeah. the end of the month. So we're, and we want everybody to get the size that they want and whether it's a men's or a women's shirt. Yeah. There's two shirts that I have right now or that i'm working on right now one of them is a 13 o'clock shirt it has me and you on it doesn't it yeah okay yeah just I, our little face and the other one is a, is a kugel con shirt yeah it's, it's got a mexican motif it's pretty yeah. neat yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of similar to the ones on our zazzle store but it's yeah. just like white and it's like a simplified <laughs> slightly simplified uh yeah. type of design but like i said we're hand screen printing these every time and we're just going to send them out yeah. quarterly plus eventually we're going to set up like an ebay store yeah. where if you want one of the other designs because i'm eventually going to end up having at least four designs yeah one. there's two more i got enough to do two more it's just that we haven't decided what design yet yeah we haven't decided I'm, i, I want to do a faceless villain one once everything's ready we're going to put them up on the ebay store now somebody suggested that we do uh a design <coughs> with baby cookie on it like she could become like the mascot for well the what show. i was thinking you know how we had one where i was going to put something on the back yeah. Like a little label. Mm -hmm. Normally, there's going to be a clock with me and you in it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a 13 behind that. Maybe we'll have a 13 with a clock over it and inside that clock face, maybe Cookie's face. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what it is. Because like, one thing I wanted to do, I'm like, if, I think that's a really cool idea, like making yeah. little baby Cookie, who we call Pookie most of the time. Mm -hmm. Making little Pookie like the, uh, the mascot for the show. I said, but if we do a cartoon of her... I mean, yes, her face is adorable, but one of her distinguishing features is her little stumpy Manx tail. Yeah. So it would have to be a cartoon where you could see her little stumpy Manx tail. Yeah. Because that's fact, one of the funniest things about her. If we receive she fan art it. of Baby Cookie, and it's cool, <laughs> I'll do a shirt of it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. That's good. Yeah. Let's farm this shit out. Like, I can draw, but I haven't done it for a really long time. We're so busy, we don't, we, we don't have time for that in any way. Yeah. Well, I, we could, but... Uh, yeah, it probably wouldn't take that long to do a little cartoon. Actually, uh, we had a fan send us a, uh, one of me and you. I kind of... I love I actually part. would like to have that on a shirt, but I, I think I don't think I could do... I don't have permission yet. Well, and, I, I, I could ask her if we could use it. it would have to be a multi... I think it would probably be, have to be a multicolored shirt. Yeah, that might be one that we could sell in the Zazzle, Zazzle store, but... Yeah, um, I'd probably want to do three colors at least. Yeah, because it's so, like, intricate and, like, yeah. the colors are dark and cool and everything. And it's like, I don't... I think that would, like, lose a lot of its coolness if it was just, like, printed in white right. or whatever. I don't Which, think that it That means would I had to make cool. three different screens for it. Yeah, that's what I mean. But, or, you know, or it actually is small. I could probably do two colors on one screen do it twice. Yeah. And then another screen. We'll see. Maybe, maybe I can do a four color version of it. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Like okay. I said, you know, we we're two doing, might be enough. Yeah, white and red or something. We're very know. excited about doing all the screen printing stuff. Yeah. By the way, I mean, we just we just went the other day and bought like almost all the yeah all the stuff. We haven't bought the shirts yet because we don't have everyone's sizes. So. I haven't done it in a long time, but I was good, man. I did like a six color one one time when I was in school. Just the old. The old way with the exacto blades. Yeah, you had to cut out. shit out with an exacto had, blade. Had one Before of, they had the photo emulsion. Eddie Van Halen holding his guitar. I got it from the cover of Rolling Stone. 
and you know, had, red <laughs> had, had all the tape wrapped around. You didn't tell me that. Yeah. Eddie Van Halen. Eddie Van Halen. His face with the yeah, guitar, the red one with all the with all like, stripes. Black yeah, and he's holding black it like that. It was the cover of a Rolling Stone Very magazine. Guitar. I did that in old. I know. Oh, okay. School. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Did that in old school Silk Street. It came out wonderful. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I just did it right. I can't shit on you. Did much. his Cause face because like, really... in my art class, it's like usually we did. I, th- I think I did like all these like drawings and stuff like Morrissey and Nick Cave and yeah. stuff like that. So you know, the face was perfect. Yeah. You could yeah, you could recognize exactly who that was. Because I didn't over detail, it was just two colors. It was flesh color and black. And the black was just a sha- the shadows of his face, his lips, his nose, and his eyes. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was just the suggestion that worked. It worked beautifully. Yeah. yeah I wish worked. you still had it. You know what's funny is that I only had only had one copy of it because it was it was for a grade. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? And I had it on a white shirt. Yeah. And uh Somebody grabbed it because it, cause the the screens were school property. After I got done, they cut it out and, and re recycled the reused the, scr- the screen. The, the uh, not the screen, the well, frames. Yeah, the frames. Yeah. But I couldn't say anything. You know, I didn't really care. Well, yeah, you didn't buy the frames. No, I, I, I didn't mean, buy, it wasn't any of my stuff. Yeah, I mean, this time around, we bought our own right. frames and screens, so we can do whatever the fuck we want to. Oh, and that reminds me too of like one other thing. Somebody in the comment section recommended because. I think I think this had to do with the comment that someone left who was a new viewer and they said that they loved the show but they couldn't concentrate because you were too hot. Fucking right, I'm too Oh yeah. And this is I think this that. was part of that whole situation yeah. and you I think you commented something <laughs> so you like should have seen me when I was funny. And somebody and I think too that we had been talking about um <clears throat> You know, you had been talking about, like, Bible camp and stuff like that, like, on the last yeah. show that we did about the Girl Scout camp yeah. and stuff. And somebody recommended, it's like, you guys should put pictures of yourselves in the show when you were kids so we could see what you look like. Yeah, put them on there. So okay. I'm going to have to look. Books. Now, you have to send me one that I'm allowed to use because I don't know if I'm okay, allowed I've to seen put some. ones. I got some. I know there's some in this house that I really, I like that baby one of you where you look like Damien. Baby, I mean, which one was that? I don't even remember where it went to. It used to be like um, in a frame or I, something around that, here. That printer. You were probably I, only like three at the time. That printer that I that I have in storage yeah. is also a scanner. Maybe we yeah, can I hook know. that up and we can scan off of that. Or I can just take a picture of it with my phone. Oh, that's true. That would be much quicker. I forgot. Modern technology. I was just going to say. It's Modern like, what? Well, I don't need a fucking scanner. Yeah. Come on. I got, a, I got a bunch of shit, though. Yeah. I was adorable as a child. Yeah. Everyone will get to see my natural hair color. Yeah. Ooh, that'll be a big surprise. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what that'll be. Well, I know. You guys will know. All right. So, um, do you want to get to the topic? You doing all Go right? Go ahead. I'm good. All right. I'm not, you know, on. I'm not firing on all cylinders yet. Yeah, this is just the first one we're recording tonight. We're yeah. not. We, it wasn't like last time where yeah, he had last already, time where he had already like we had already done a movie review. Yeah. And it was like. I went back and been I, drinking for like an hour. I went back and watched that. It, it was pretty good. I took a bunch of good. it out because. Oh yeah! I, oh yeah! I started. I was talking shit. I had to take some of it out because we actually got into an argument. Yeah, she was drunk too. <laughs> because we were, and he just kept going off on these like flights. Yeah, and she was getting mad. And at he me. was just going on, and I'm just like, please, can I end this show? I'm so tired. And he just kept going on and going on and going. You should on. see us when we're drunk, though. Like sometimes we do fight. That's yeah. not, it's not, they're not violent fights, but, you know. Yeah, she not always. Make, she started making fun of me and shit. <laughs> well, you just kept talking. I was like. And then the bartenders would go, go, Jenny, leave him alone. Jenny, remember that shit? <laughs> Our bartenders know it's coming, and I'm sitting there looking Either like. Either that or. I'm d- sitting there li- on the bar looking like a broken man, and she's sitting there going. Hey, blah, 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 and like, <laughs> <laughs> he can't take it, man. I'm so yeah. mean. No, and really. It, it's over like dumb shit. But you know what, though? <laughs> like, I didn't dance. Oh, no, it's over with. It's over with. She's you got know, this thing where if I don't dance exactly when she wants to dance, then she's through. Oh, I'm through with you. Well, I'm just going to go I'm dance through. with some other people. But you don't yeah. dance with other people either. You just sit there and go, I ain't dancing with you. Yeah. I ain't Remember that shit? Yeah. Well, yeah. no, but I was. what I was going to say, though, was yeah. that um, our our bartenders, I mean, we, yeah. we know them really well. We've been going there for years and years. Yeah, I call Lee my son. Yeah. He's a British guy. Yeah, he calls us mom and dad, like, yeah. when we come in there. He's not he's not quite young enough to be our kid, but almost. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, like, him and our other bartender, whose name is Tiffany, and I love her. She's yeah. adorable. Yeah. Um, 
They always say that they can tell when Tom is drunk, but they can't tell when I yeah, am. Yeah, no. Jenny always seems sober. Yeah. And she always seems to make sense, but she's not making sense. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually good at keeping oh, shit man. together, but you know. This gets holier than that when she's drunk. Yeah, I yeah. do kind of. Yeah. Oh, well. But it's and it. she's smarter than me when she's drunk. I'm always smarter than you, motherfucker, <laughs> even when I'm sober. <laughs> Don't you forget it. Oh man! <laughs> you I got right, those primal. You instinct. watch right into that. One, I got though, those primal. I got. I set you up for that. I set you up for that one. But I, I got okay, those primal. That's how you want to spin it. That's cool. I got those primal <laughs> instincts that offset your intelligence, though. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I got all that street wisdom. He's Kirk and I'm Spock. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly. Yeah. That's it. I'm Kirk and you're Spock. Yeah. You're fucking, that is exactly what That's exactly doing. the That's dynamic. exactly the dynamic. Shit, even my ex-husband used to call me Spock. Yeah? All right. You're not the only, you're not the first person to notice the resemblance. Yeah. Yeah, I get called that a lot. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, that's exactly what's that's going exactly on. That's exactly what it is. All right, so let's talk about some demon possession, shall we? Mm-hmm. All right, now, this case is actually fairly recent. Uh, only happened about 11 years ago. This happened in 2008. This is the case, it's just called Julia. We don't know the real name of the woman at the center of this because she kind of like didn't want, like the guy that wrote about it, she didn't want her real name used. She said, you can publish my case, but please just give me a pseudonym. So he just calls her Julia. So this is a Julia demon possession case. Now, Interestingly enough, the guy at the center of this, as I said, is this guy named Richard E. Gallagher. Now, Richard E. Gallagher is a board-certified psychiatrist, graduated from both Princeton University and the Yale University School of Medicine. So this is no quack. This is no, you know, paranormal. I got my degree online. This is nothing, nothing like that, okay? This is like an actual legit... Doctor of Psychiatry. Now, it should be noted, however, that uh, Dr. Gallagher is uh, and was raised a practicing Catholic and is at least open to the possibility that demons could be real. Although, he says if they are real, and he's careful to use that signifier... Um, then them possessing people is an exceptionally, exceptionally rare case. He's like 99 times out of 100, somebody comes to you and says they're possessed by a demon. It's simply a mental illness. Um, But he does leave open the possibility that demons can possess people. And the case of Julia is one case that he has very openly championed as being the only case that he knows of, of a genuinely possessed person. All right? All right. So, now, Julia, like I said, no one knows her real name. All they know about her uh, is that she's an American woman. She was middle-aged in 2008 when she approached uh, the Catholic Church for help, claiming that she was demonically possessed. Now, as I said, she actually approached them herself. She said that she had... um, been brought up a Catholic, but that in later years, maybe in her teenage years, I don't know, they don't really specify, that she had gotten interested in Satanism and um, so kind of became involved in a Satanic cult or Satanic belief system or whatever. Now, Gallagher says that when she first showed up or when he first met her, she had the whole regalia, man. She had, like, the black robes and all the eye... You know, she looked like a goth, pretty much. Uh, at least that's how I'm interpreting his description of her. Mm-hmm. Now, he has actually gone... Rec- and I've, I've watched, like, a couple interviews with this guy. He doesn't seem like a crazy person. Um, you know, he, he could very well be, but I don't really know. He seemed like a normal, rational, intelligent person to me. So he said that when he first met her... The fact that she came forward and said, yes, I've been involved in Satanism for many years, and I think that might be the reason that I'm now suffering from these, uh, you know, symptoms, which I think may be demonic possession. Um, You know, so she was initially reluctant to approach the Catholic Church because she felt kind of like ambivalent about it, but it was getting to a point where it was like unlivable, and so she felt she needed help. 
Now, interestingly, as I said, when she first came and said, oh, I've been involved in a satanic cult, Gallag- Gallagher was like, hey. Yeah. He's like, because that seems like... You know what I mean? That that's seems like, like something you did. That's, that's something. like something that so many people would say. And you see all these fucking... Like, even on... We've done, like, jokes done about, shows on about a haunting and stuff like that where, yeah. you know, the the minute, like, somebody gets demonically possessed, oh, they used a Ouija board, or oh, they were interested in Satanism, or whatever. It's it, all very stereotypical. Yeah, it just seems like a very stereotypical right. narrative. So, when she came forward... It actually forward, seems like almost like a Hollywood narrative. That's exactly what it... Repeated over and over Yeah, again. that's exactly like what it seems Indian like. Indian burial grounds. It yeah, was on it's an like Indian burial... Fuck it's out like of here. All it's right. like that. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying that there aren't people that did, like, Satan shit in there, but, but I feel like the percentage is, like, really, really small. Like, who fucking... Did you know anybody that did that? No. I didn't either. No. The only... Th- when I was growing up... Well... In the summers in Mississippi, there was nobody involved in any kind of Satanism there. You'd get killed in Mississippi if you were involved in any kind of Satanism. Uh, now, in Michigan, because I lived a couple a uh, couple years in Trenton, Michigan, if people that know me, there's only one dude there that I think might have been a Satanist. It was a long story about this weird, mysterious motherfucker. I think, mysterious motherfucker. Yeah, that, that guy, <laughs> that guy there, and his little his little pack of misfits. I think he was, uh, his fake name was Logan. Oh, like Wolverine? Lo- something like or the Wolverine other. Movie. No, it's fake. Yeah, he called himself <laughs> Logan, something or other. But we knew who he really was. And I want you to bleep out what that real name was. I don't want that in the. In, in the okay. <laughs> okay. Redact it. Redact that shit, okay? <laughs> his uncle was a cop, and his uncle thought he was. A, 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 a fledgling serial killer. Mm. I mean, they were finding dead cats and shit around it up in his room and oh, stuff. Oh, that and reminded it, me of it's, another. It's one of those guys. Okay. Left. I'll get into that. In and second. I can tell you some creepy shit about this dude. He'd be up there playing Galaga in Seven Eleven in the middle of the night, making his granddad fucking sit wait in the car for him. It was just a creepy. His granddad could just leave him there. He'd, he'd like slap his granddad around and shit. It was just weird, man. There was a, like a weird story about that guy, but. uh we considered that guy to be a Satanist back in those days. Looking back on it, I just think that he was just a, he was just a, a, a bad dude. Yeah, he's he was a bad just du- a douche. No, no, he wasn't a douche. That was the weird thing about him is that uh, he was very serious, super serious, and very kind of mysterious. He didn't act out. He was very much like inward. And uh, he had this girlfriend that was kind of like, oh, man. His, uh, his your hand gestures are <laughs> not, you know yeah it was like his girlfriend was his slave maybe and then he had like these guys that were with him who were also you know high schoolers who were I don't know, almost like worshippers he was almost like a cult leader that reminds me we, like we need to do a show about fucking yeah. Rod Farrell and all that bullshit. he was like that he was like a Rod Farrell because those bitches were that happened here yeah. didn't it in Florida, or yeah. From here. Well, I worked for his attorney. The, uh, yeah, I know. Remember, for a while. Yeah, I know you did. Yep, yeah, that's a long story. Uh, but, uh, not really yeah. a long story, but uh, yeah, she wasn't his attorney for very long, though. He replaced her with another attorney, but like in the first few months, that was his. I saw his case files. Yeah. Yeah, when I was working at her office. But uh, that guy is also a douche. But yeah, I would like to meet Rob Farrell actually. Would you? Yeah, I'd like to go to prison and meet him. I'd do an interview with him. You wouldn't? Mm, I would. I don't know. I don't know what the point of it would well, be. I wouldn't like to meet him as like I, you know, <laughs> like I'm starstruck or anything, but that would make an awesome show. Yeah. Although, I don't know. He doesn't, um, some serial killers and stuff like that kind of fascinate, like their psychology fascinates me. Not him so much. Well, I know what he is. You know, we're goths. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not falling for all that. You know what I mean? His vampire role-playing. That's what I mean. You know well, what I mean? But see, I don't... Those kind of people just, like, annoy me. So I feel like I'd probably just be annoyed. I wouldn't mind just going down there and interviewing him, talking about music, and then fucking talk about the crime, and yeah. see how he's doing in prison, and, uh, you know, whether or not he regrets his mistake. If he's, if, is he still a... Is he still Visago? <laughs> is he still Visago the vampire, or is he... You know, God. Hopefully, he's grown out of that. Or right is it? Now. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I would like to know. That's another but, thing that is it because you know, 
you you probably kind of experienced some of this too, but it's like, you know, I went to school in the 80s and looking kind of gothy, listening to gothy music that a lot of people didn't know back then. Um, you know, I got tagged with Satanist all the time because they didn't know what a goth was in the 80s. Not yeah. really. I mean, no, not where just, I grew up. I was, it's kind of the same thing. You know, they just kind of throw shit at you. Yeah, so yeah. I just they got double things at you. all the time. If you're walking around, a car would go by, and they'd throw some shit at you. Yeah, I remember That's that. Little... Also, Come every... out of the club, you know, and they, you know, they make slurs. Yeah. They would assume they would assume your sexual orientation if you were a guy. They yeah. would assume that you were gay. Everyone just assumed I was yeah. a Satanist. Or, right. you know what I mean? It's, right. And also, every time I went to the mall, um, all the... You know, the, the retail people would follow me around because they thought yeah. I was going to steal stuff. <laughs> even though I was, like, the nerdiest, like, little goody two-shoes ever. I didn't even, like, start smoking and drinking until I was, like, in, in my late 20s, maybe. <laughs> it's like, when I was a teenager, I did, like, nothing bad. Well, when I was in high school, I was mostly, you know, into metal. And then I started to get into goth. Goth didn't really, when I was in high school, really didn't have that much of a look. It wasn't solidified. And then I ended up in the Army pretty quick. So, you know... I really couldn't do anything because I was gone, you know, all the time. Yeah. So then I come back to Boston, you know, and get back into the scene. And basically, I'm Dave Vanian for a few years. You know, nice. talking about until that shit. You remember what nineties goth was? Yeah. And then it just kind of evolved, you know. But we got to get back to the fucking scene. We're not talking about goth. We're talking about. <laughs> we're talking, we're about, talking about. Yeah. Satanism. Yeah, we're talking about Satanism. And we're talking about how this girl, this woman, Julia, she initially came to the Catholic Church and said she'd been into Satanism. And that she thought she was possessed by a demon, and it was getting to the point where she couldn't really handle it anymore. So she needed their help, even though she was kind of, like, ambivalent about it. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, um, as you've probably seen in many movies and stuff like that, they don't initially jump to demon possession, which, you know, to their credit, um, you know, <laughs> amid all the other things that they mm. can be accused of, uh, they don't usually jump right to that. They usually try to, like you know, get rid of all the other possibilities before they go to demon possession. Even then, it's, like, really super hard to, like, get an exorcism. So one of the first things they did, like, after this woman approached them, was they went to uh, Dr. Richard Gallagher, who was kind of their go-to guy, because he was, like, a psychiatrist, and he'd been, like, he had all these, like, advanced degrees and stuff, but he was still a practice, practicing Catholic. So he was one of the ones they went to to say, hey, is this person just nuts, or is there something here that we need to investigate, or whatever. Now, he says that when he first met her, um, again, she had, like, the whole goth thing going on, so that kind of made him skeptical at first, too, because he said, oh, this seems, like, very stereotypical. But then he said that she... One of the things she did was that she knew, like, people's secrets, like, in the room. She had, like, some weird, like, psychic ability kind okay. of shit going on, which kind of freaked him out. Yeah, so what, what, was, what do they call that? They call that... Uh... Cryptic knowledge? No. What do they call it? It's an ability sometimes that that so so called possessed people might have. Yeah. I think it's a part of a person being a poltergeist agent, though. Really, part of you know, But I forgot the. Yeah, I, I can't the remember the word. Term. I know what you're talking about, but I can't remember the word either. Uh, arcane knowledge? No. Uh, fuck. What's the term? Anyway, yeah, it's knowing something that you have no way of knowing, like. Um, a good example is uh, some poltergeist agents have reportedly had the ability to tell you how much money there was in your pocket or where you had just come from and yeah. who you just talked to. They, uh, in the Enfield poltergeist, evidently, that's that's the way it was with Janet. Janet could answer questions about another person. She had no way of knowing. Yeah. yeah. That seemed to be the case with this chick also. Um, she seemed to know things about... Um, and she had supposedly never met any of these people before, but she supposedly knew, like, their family members' names, like, if their family members had died, what they had died of, uh, what they had been doing, like, the day before, yeah. um, you know, what clothes they had been wearing. She supposedly knew that kind of stuff. Now, interestingly, one of the first things, and I think when I was researching my book, um, c c there was a couple different sources on this. One of the, a couple of the sources said that she knew... Um, this thing about, like, all this stuff that had happened with these cats, like, freaking out in someone's house. And 
the sources that I saw, I attributed it to someone that was just kind of there at the time. But then the other day I was watching an interview with Richard Gallagher himself. And he said, the first time I met Julia, the first thing she said to me was something like, those cats really went crazy last night, didn't they? That was like the first thing she said. And he said, you know, I have two cats and about two, three in the morning for whatever reason, you know, they started fighting and like freaking out and they'd never done that before. And it woke me and my wife up and we thought it was very weird. So he's like, so I just come in and meet this woman that I'd never met before. And that was the first thing she said to me was that, wow, those cats really freaked out last night. Those cats really like went bad shit or something like that. She said something like that to him. So he thought that was really creepy. Like I said, it was. I thought it was weird that like a couple sources said that it was like somebody else, but I, then I saw a thing yeah. with Doctor Gallagher. And he said, Dear, "No, that was me." During my episode, I didn't have, I didn't really have that ability, or if that's what you want to call it, or that phenomenon did not appear. Yeah. But what I kind of imagine, maybe it's kind of a situation where the the agent is actually reading the memories, or somehow sensing the memories of the target. That's what yeah. I think is going on, and it just kind of comes to them. You know, they're not doing it on purpose; they just see it. In a vision. Yeah. And they make a comment about it. That's probably how that goes down. It, yeah, it may, very well maybe. And, you know, Stuart Hamroff would say it had, it had to do with, like, quantum consciousness. Yeah. That's how he would say. That's how he would explain it. Which, what Stuart Hamroff says, you know, I, I give a lot of credence to that. It checks out with my observations. Yeah. Yeah. But so, yeah, so that whole thing uh, happened... So then Dr. Gallagher is kind of, like, giving her the standard, you know, kind of psychiatric rundown and, like, seeing if there's anything, um, you know, particularly, you know, any red flags or anything like that. Now, he says that she seemed like a very well-adjusted, very intelligent woman. She didn't seem to have any mental instability of any kind or any mental illness of any kind. Um, You know, so she, she didn't really seem to have anything wrong with her. So he started to think, well, maybe there's something to this. So he tells that to the church. They all kind of like, you know, get together and have meetings with her and things like that. Because like I said, this this demonic possession that she said that she had was apparently starting to cause her a great deal of, um, you know, of distress. And she really wanted something done about it. So they were all trying to help her out. Now, during some of the sessions that they had with her, um, which usually included uh, Dr. Gallagher would be there. There'd be like a bunch of different clergy there. Sometimes there would be um, like students and things that were like volunteers that kind of came to observe and whatnot. So a lot of people were witnesses to this type of stuff. Um, They said that she would go uh, into trances that she um, would usually talk in different voices, just like in The Exorcist. She could talk in, like, other people's voices and stuff that weren't like hers. Um, One of them was, like, a very, very deep, like, a man's voice. One of them was, like, a really high-pitched voice. Um, They said when she went into the trances, like, when she was, like, in her normal, like, day-to-day whatever, um, she was just very, like I said, she seemed very intelligent, very even-keeled, you know, nothing weird about her at all. But when she went into these specific trances, they said she would get very combative. She would get very, uh, you know, she would start spewing profanities. She would start, um, you know, going on the whole anti-religious shtick. Like I said, just like in The Exorcist where she was just like, you know. In a certain way, though, like Enfield Poltergeist and like yeah. Yeah, Mountain Poltergeist. It's, it's that, it's, this is already sound like that same phenomenon, if you ask me. It definitely does. And like I said, you know, I wrote a whole book called The Unseen Hand that's all about different poltergeist phenomena. And there's like a an amazing amount of um similarities similarities between a lot of the manifestations, like from case to case, whether it's demonic but whether it's considered demonic possession or not. It's psychic. I'm telling you, I was there, I saw shit. It's psychic. It's not demonic. Yeah. If it is a real phenomenon, I think it's all it is a real phenomenon same thing. I think it's all the same thing. She's always forgetting. It's a real phenomenon. You only got a little taste of it. Had you yeah. lived that shit for a couple weeks on end, you go, yeah, that shit's real. I'm just saying now, that... You saw a couple of things jump off here or there, yeah. but, you know, shit, if you get a real strong, young, poltergeist agent, you know, 12, 13, 14, maybe early 20s, with the right 
emotional situation, you know, going on. That shit will impress you. It doesn't last long, though. Yeah. A couple weeks. And it's gone. Yeah. You know, um, uh, Janet was the longest one. She was, what, 18 months? I think it was about a year and a half, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, I I wrote about some that went on for years and years, but that's very, very unusual. (sighs) Yeah. It it normally just kind of burns out, you know, the... Although the weird thing about this woman is that, I mean... I don't know how old she was when she first contacted the Roman Catholic Church about wanting an exorcism, but they did say she was middle-aged, quote-unquote, so I'm guessing mm. she was in her 40s, maybe? Yeah. Which, that's there doesn't a little seem, strange. There doesn't, yeah, that's unusual, but there doesn't seem to be an age limit. I mean, I was in my 40s when you saw the that's phenomenon true. that you saw. And I wrote about a couple of cases where it was just, like older women that just, they thought yeah. were the focus. It just tends not to be as strong. Although that one older woman, you're talking about one of the little gold flakes that would appear on things. and you know. But I think she was just kind of unusually pent up. And it's yeah. always kind of a repressive culture where they come from. And it's, or a kind of a, a, a repressed situation. It's, you know... Emotion has a lot to do with it. Yeah, I feel like it's people that have to, like, tamp down their emotions for whatever reason. So they're sort of, like, leaking out. Yeah, they're acting out. Like a jiffy pop. Yeah, they're they're acting out. Well, I don't want to use the word, but I've got to use the word. They're acting out psychically as so it can be deniable, so they won't be blamed for it. Well, yeah, because they're like, it's not me. It's just some, like, evil force. It's the demon doing it. It's yeah. some evil force, like, moving shit around and throwing yeah. things at people and scratching them and stuff. The only one, the only exception, I would think, is um, the Rain Man. Yeah. I mean, he knew it was him, basically. He knew that he had power, he had the power to do it, but he also thought that there was demonic forces involved. And, and as far as I know, he still believes that. Yeah. I think that he thought that something was, was like, inside of him that was yeah. doing it. Oh, goodness, Baby Cookie's kitty. moving the camera. Baby Cookie! she doing, man. No. What are you doing? Stop it. <laughs> now that I moved it, she's going to move it again. Yeah, uh, she's like, why? Oh, I, this is the game, huh? I had it the way I wanted it. Oh, yeah. Why are you fucking it all up? Yeah, yeah she's... Yeah, she's yeah. going to move it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, she's like, what? She's Pookie, peeking out from behind my laptop. Pookie, come here. Come here, Pookie. Pookie come here, Pookie. Be on come the here. show. Come here, Pookie. That was another, uh, that was another comment that I got. That apparently when people are just listening to the show and doing other things, yeah, as boy. soon as we say, Ow, she me. as soon as we say, hey, here's the kitty, yeah. they come running back in so they can see her. There she there is. There is Pookie. There's little Pookie. Pookie's not possessed by yeah. a demon, are you, baby? I don't think. Does she scratch you? Yeah. She's not mad. Bad, though. She didn't want to be picked up. She's like, no, I was having yeah. fun pushing the camera around. Okay, get back to the show. All right. So, yeah, so she would go into these trance states. She would start doing, like, the exorcist shit about, you know, uh, you know, saying all kind of, like, profane things about religion and, like, shitting on religion as a concept and, I guess, and whatnot, and saying things about people in the room. And when she woke up, quote-unquote, from these trance states, she would say that she had no memory of them. Now... In most situations, um, and in cases where there is no other manifestation present, i.e. things moving around on their own, things of that nature, um, someone who just displayed this type of behavior would usually be diagnosed with some sort of dissociative disorder. And uh, Dr. Gallagher has said that in 99 times out of 100, you come, somebody comes to you like presenting these types of uh, you know, behaviors, then that is what you would, um, that's basically what you would say that they had. They had some kind of dissociative disorder. Um, if there was no other thing, like no other unexplainable thing, manifestations going on. I've mentioned it earlier. I think poltergeist comes from the poltergeist phenomenon, as I know it, comes from a situation that really doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Because social media... And interconnectivity to, between well, people. Well, people have a lot more opportunity to vent. To vent now. it's just... And to find people with similar interests or similar, right. um, you know, I, I don't want to say like similar uh, mental illnesses or, so, yeah. you know, that type of thing. Simple. But... They, they can vent because they can find people in similar situations. And yeah. They can also and talk. Yeah. And they can communicate with others, which kind of helps release pressure. 
Yeah, I because mean, you know you're not alone. Right, you know, other exactly. people feel the same way as you. It's like you can talk to other people about if it. You're gonna find and this, they can relate to you. If you're gonna find this phenomenon today, you're gonna find it in a place that's gonna be some kind of pent up religious community. Maybe some Amish people. Maybe some Mormons, one of these Mormon cults. I was gonna say if anybody yeah, Amish is listening right. right now and then I'm like, Oh yeah, you wouldn't know. Maybe <laughs> somebody in the Middle East or oh, well. in Africa where there's a religiosity but not really interconnectivity, you're gonna find it there. Um although it does exist in the modern era too, because remember the girl that from from, from Paranormal Witness that I talked to? The one from the cat episode from very what yeah, was yeah, her yeah. name? Uh I forgot I her name. I can't remember what her name was, but yeah, yeah, I'm friends with her on Facebook. I talked to her about it for hours, you know. Um but I can't remember her name off. We believe that it was her stepsister that was doing it. Yeah. And that was in the modern era. She caught some of it on her cell phone. Yeah. She even sent me some recorded messages from her cell phone. She shared them with me. I have them. She gave me permission to share it. Yeah. Of the damn poltergeist leaving a message. And it was fucking creepy. We never oh, got. Oh, you played that for I me, have didn't it. you? Yeah, yeah I that have was it. pretty creepy. But I was uh, never. Um, I haven't shared it yet because she didn't come on the show. She talked we, about coming on the show, yeah, but we she were, never got we around. We were talking it. to her about it, but we never got around to doing it. And I was going to save it for that because that was a really good episode. Of yeah, Paranormal she has like creepy as shit. <laughs> she has a clip that came on her. Uh, it came as a voice message from I, I can't remember what the address she said it came from. It came from basically nowhere. Yeah. It was just on her phone. Like an unknown message. Yeah, and it's something. just kind of a weird electrical sound going ee, like that. And then you hear like a what sounds like a voice going Yeah. Sounds like kitty 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 kitty. And and it I makes would pee my pants if I got that. It makes phone, sense seriously. in in relation to the case. Because they got the poltergeist on this cat kick. Dude threw the cat out. A, a yeah, it was like a, a little cat, ceramic cat. Ceramic, and then from there on out, it started writing "cat" on the wall over and over and over and over. And they found all these little scribbles of the word "cat" everywhere. Yeah, like all over the wall. And so then so. she got a message on her cell phone, and it was kitty 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 kitty. It sounded like kitty 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 kitty. Yeah, kitty. yeah. So poltergeist tend to be pretty fucking weird. I've heard it's, it. It's kind <laughs> of a it's a mindless phenomenon that comes from the subconscious, and yeah. it's. Uh, the subconscious, the thing that makes dreams and dream characters in your dreams come to life. Well, imagine that thing acting out using using telekinesis. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about poltergeists and demons. Yeah. Yeah, it's a part of you. It's the thing in your dreams that attacks you when you're fighting. Yeah, it's you, I, but I it's believe just that. another version of you. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. That's, like I said, that's kind of, the, that's kind of where I'm coming from and uh, coming at yeah. it, too. Yeah, because in every case, it, in a way, obliquely responds to the wishes of the damn poltergeist agent. It well, always that's serves. What I mean. that's Even if it's why, attacking you, it's serving your best interest. That's why when I wrote Unseen Hand, I said, I'm going to put a whole chapter in here about demonic possession because I really think that demonic possession is probably just the same type of like poltergeist or psychokinetic phenomenon just interpreted through a religious or a yeah. particularly Catholic lens. Well, the guy that was there on that first on that on that um, exorcism that the exorcist was based on. Yeah, he was he he wasn't the exorcist himself. He was the guy helping. Yeah, he wrote a whole book about it. He said no, it's poltergeist phenomenon. It was psychokinesis. It sounded like he that, saw it happen, and then when he when he read more about it, and he got into the parapsychological material. He goes, "Yeah, that's what it was." I mean, the kid was like was not flying around, like he would no. make chairs fly yeah. around when he was sitting in them, like they would push against the wall and it's stuff. It's not a and demon. It's not a demon as described in the Old Testament. He was or like the making words on his skin. A real demon would fucking wipe out a city. See, that's the All right. that's what bothers me. It's like why why You're right. would a demon of all things right. waste their time messing around this old possessing shit. a twelve year old kid in De some nowhere? Why would they do that? A demon as described in religious literature wipes out shit like whole cities. Right. Or it causes cities of people right. to become sinful. Weird shit like that. Like, you know, like Yeah, they can do like superhero shit or super hero, villain shit. Super villain shit. Yeah. They can do super villain shit. Yeah, they don't mess around with children. They don't Why do would they possess one person yeah. no. and make one person 
throw up and jerk off with a crucifix. Why? Like, yeah, they're not into that. They had a hard time explaining that in the movie Exorcist. Yeah. Of why it was happening. Although I love that movie. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> we just saw it a couple of days ago. The power of Christ compels you. Yeah, we did. We yeah, just yeah, rewatched yeah, it. I never get tired of that movie. It's a good movie. That's like it's like in my top five. It's like that, The Shining. Uh, there's a couple other movies that I just I can just watch over and over again, and I just never get tired of them. Oh, Max was Von Sydowing the fuck out of that movie. He really, really yes, was. he was. Do you know he was in a whole bunch of like? He um, was old back when he was young. Well, he was in a bunch of like Ingmar Bergman movies, like yeah. back in the day. Yeah. I totally want to do a review of. I know. I know you don't really like like art movies and stuff, but I totally want to do a review of Hour of the Wolf one of these days. David Lynch was totally right. influenced by that shit. Okay. That was like a creepy. I think it was like the. It's like pretty much the closest thing to a horror movie that Ingmar Bergman Bergman ever did. Okay. It creeped me the fuck out. It'll end up and he, on and, a, he, and Max von Sydow was in that, too. It'll end up on a Death in Rome video. <laughs> it probably will at yeah. some point. There's some really, like, creepy, disturbing imagery in that. So, since we were talking about uh, phones, because we were talking about the, the kitty poltergeist yeah. there, one of the things that kind of interested me about this Julia case was this phone shit that she would do. So, now, what Dr. Gallagher said was that occasionally... Him and the other people that were consulting on the case, which like priests, nuns, like I said, there were other students there that were observing and stuff. And they would like call each other and like talk about the case. Now, several of them said that while they were having discussions about the case on the phone, another voice would break in on the phone call that was supposedly Julia. Sometimes it was Julia's voice or sometimes it was one of the other voices that she would do. And her voice would come on and say shit like, leave her alone, you idiot. Um, she's ours. Uh, leave, you imbecile priest. Things like that. So they would get like these phone calls. This was like after hours. They weren't around her at the time. They were just like at their houses. Hmm. And they were calling each other. Right. You know, talking about the case. And it could have been her because she was there present. Well, either that or she was, like, in the hospital or wherever okay. the hell they were keeping her. So she didn't have access to a phone. Well, and the thing is, it's like, how would she be able to break into a phone call between two, two unrelated other pe- oh, people? Okay, unrelated. That's what I'm saying. Okay. They'd be talking okay. to each other, like, okay. from their respective houses. So she wasn't even on the and line. And all of a sudden, her voice would, like, okay. turn up on okay. the call. Okay. And everybody's like, what the fuck? Is I thought it? you meant that they were talking to her. And then no. Now the voice was about, no, okay. no, 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 no. Okay. That's a, yeah, that would just be normal. This mm. was like way weirder because they're like, yeah, we didn't do like three way call. This was like, you know, right. they weren't doing like three way calling or nothing. She would just like break in on the fucking line with one of her weird voices and have these like quote unquote demonic voices saying, it's like, oh, she's ours and you can't have her and all this other kind of stuff. Just like an exorcist, like I said. Um, another thing that she uh, could do, like I said, she had psychic abilities. She told Dr. Gallagher that his mom had died of ovarian cancer, which was true. Mm. Um, so that kind of freaked him out a little bit. Um, she also, as I said, she could uh, tell what like people were doing like when, when they weren't there. Like, she's like, oh, this person is doing this, that, and the other, like, right now. And then later on, they would find out that that was correct. Um, she would do kind of shit like, you know, you're just your standard exorcist type stuff. She'd like, like animal sounds. She could talk uh, in Latin and in Spanish, um, which apparently neither language of which she knew. Because I, I guess she said English was the only language that she spoke. But she could speak recognizable Spanish and recognizable Latin. Um, you know, shit like that. Um, also another thing that they thought was interesting was that, and I like that they do this test because they said one of the things that makes it so that they will actually say that maybe it's an actual demon possession is they'll do a test where they'll sprinkle holy water on you or then they'll sprinkle tap water on you. you got no and service. if you flip out like to the tap water, like it burns like in the yeah. exorcist, then they think you're faking. Right. But if you can tell the difference without them saying, then that's like another point in your favor. And apparently she was able to do that because they would, you know, hit her with tap water and she wouldn't do anything, but they would hit her with actual mm. holy water that had been blessed by a priest and all that rigmarole. And she would know the difference. She'd be like, ah, it burns, blah, blah, blah. So she would do that kind of stuff. Now, 
apparently there were also a bunch of uh, physical, like, kind of psychokinetic kind of shit going on as well. Um, while she physical was in the room. Physical kind of psychokinetic shit. Yeah, well, you know. There you go. Where stuff would, like, fly off of shelves yeah. while she was around, much like in the, the, you know, the Robbie Mannheim case that The Exorcist was based on. Yeah. Now, some of the witnesses said that she levitated off the bed, although I read an... I read an interview with Dr. Gallagher that was in the Washington Post, I think, and he didn't mention that. So I don't know if that was like a later addition or yeah. if it just happened when he wasn't there. Like he never witnessed that personally. Yeah. Now, so many people out there, out there might be a man bullshit. How can a person do psychokinesis happily to throw something without, without grabbing it and throwing it? You know, they're doing it with their mind. That's, that's bullshit. I understand that reaction. What the theory is... Even from, um, uh, oh shit, what, what, what was the guy's name? I mean, I've been, I'm, I'm in the Drake. <laughs> Stuart Hammeroff. Stuart Hammeroff, who. I knew you he, could do it. You know, who he's, you know, he, he's he's hanging out with, you know, Sir Roger Pembrose and stuff. These guys are, you know, real scientists, physicists, you know. And he said, he, he starts talking about Schrodinger's cat. And Jenny can probably explain Schrodinger's cat better than me. It's, you know, what is reality? You know, if you put a cat in a box, how do you know the status of the cat until you open the box? You know, is the cat alive or dead? Really, you don't find out until the box is open. Then you collapse the wave function. Then you function. collapse the wave function. Well, <laughs> what we're talking about, basically, you know, I'm going to give you like a shit house version of this, okay? <laughs> is that... Reality really has a lot to do with your perception, okay, and your awareness of things. And this is actually can be proven at, at like this quantum and a subatomic level. Subatomic particles know when you're looking at them or not. Jenny could probably explain that better than me. That you, you're, you're smarter than me. Do you really understand that? How something can well, know no one understands whether, it completely. Okay, if you say that you understand quantum physics, you're fucking lying. Because yeah. I think there's nobody, only like a couple. Nobody I think there's like a couple of people that maybe maybe understand. It's not part of it. our, our brains did not evolve because it wasn't necessary for yeah. them to. Our brains right. did not evolve to. Reality is not as we think it is. That yeah yeah. We're only perceiving a certain part of reality. Reality is a lot bigger than our little monkey-like ability to perceive it. Yeah. What we're talking about is a person who's because of some kind of mental state or emotional state, their perception is so distorted that it actually distorts reality itself. That'd probably be a good way of putting it. That is a good way of putting okay. it. Per it means you're tripping so badly that reality <laughs> is fucking responding to your trip. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That'd probably be a good, simple way to explain Man, it. Man, I hope that never happens to me because that'd be some... And here's the weird thing. It's not happening by force... There's no force required to do it because this is happening outside of our understanding of what energy and force actually is. It has to do with like the perception of reality. Your perception of the reality is so distorted because you're in this mental state that other people actually see the distortions that you're causing. Yeah. That's probably... Like I'm not they're, saying... They're like, real. In, in the large majority of situations... I think most people's perce perceptions are more or less accurate because they yeah. would have to be. I mean, yeah. if if our perceptions of reality were not accurate, our species would have died out a long time ago. But the thing about it is that there's so much weird shit that we don't understand. And there might be some situations, and they're probably very rare, where... Like you said, you know, someone's perception of reality is affecting other people's perception, perception of reality, like, around them. Now, here's a weird thing. If a person can do this without any energy and any technology, then that means there may be a possibility. If you have enough technology, enough energy, you can do it. Yeah. So that's a weird fucking concept. Although, one thing that we kind of talked, and we talked about this a lot, I think that it almost seems like an... If, an Pretty much every case, other than maybe one or two that I've researched, the person could not do it on command. You can only do it when you think it's not you. Exactly. You when have you to think deny it's an the outside, ability. That's, that, that, check you that have to me. allow it rather than Tell control it. it. 
But here's yeah. the weird thing. You might be able to build a technology around this. Sure. If there are aliens coming here, and evidently, uh, recently, there are people that are involved in the government and government contractors say, yeah, we're, our pilots are seeing weird things. If aliens were to ever come here to be witnessed, they're probably using a technology based upon this concept. Basically, they're, you'd be able to fold space by doing this. Because some of the stuff that I saw, some of the phenomenons that I saw, were things basically teleporting. Okay. And not only moving without any energy, but, but fucking vanishing. You and, know, reappearing and reappearing somewhere places. else where they could Instantaneously. Instantaneously. And they couldn't have gotten sure. there without going through, you know, walls or something. Well, that's kind of like what Frank Hubert's talking about in Dune with the guild steersman taking his damn I was just going to say that I was going to say like in Dune. Like right. <laughs> well, um, you know, if there's aliens coming here, they're probably using something like that, a machine that can do that. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe. I hope I Maybe a machine action, or maybe their minds, but probably if the mind can do it, a machine can do it too. That's the way I'm... That would be super hard. Yeah. Right. Weird. <laughs> I'm tripping myself out. I know, right? His mind. I can up. see his little mind going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Whatever powers UFOs is probably some kind of the same thing that powers a poltergeist. If we ever figure it out, the, figure al it out. the aliens will just be like, "About time." Yeah, like that's just so simple. <laughs> it's like, why did it take you guys like yeah, eleven thousand years to figure this shit out? Yeah, because space <laughs> space time is not real if you look at it from this other <laughs> dimension. It's like they're looking at it from a higher dimension. Aliens are going to be like yeah. dissing us. They're like, yeah, you are worried about going this, going you know, right, left, up and down, and north, south. Now you go out, you go out of it, and then you pop back in. It's easy. Yeah, they're like, duh. If you were two dimensional and you're talking to a three dimensional person, you'd see it as bitch. Well, did you man, read bitch, Flatland? Read, like Flatland, you're like, where's this voice coming from? Because there's no concept of up or down. What well, did you read Flatland in school? There's hyper. No, I saw actually Carl Sagan talked about it on Cosmos. I know, but I read it in school. Oh, okay. When I was little. No, I saw that whole Cosmos series when I was a little kid. And I grew up on that shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That music. I love wah, that shit. Wah, wah, Vangelis love and shit. Wasn't that Vangelis doing the I think it was, actually. Doing the music to Cosmos. <laughs> it and might it have like, been. Like, pass me the joint. Did he, do char he did Chariots of Fire, too, didn't he? Chariots of Fire. Yeah. Yeah, that was like something you could smoke weed and listen to fucking... Carl well, that's, Sagan. That's true of anything. Yeah. But, yeah, well, I mean, Carl yeah. Sagan was a sexy motherfucker back in the day. He was. Hell, yeah. I understand it. I understand well, why see, I, women love that dude. Well, there's something there's something super foxy about that's why Neil deGrasse Tyson is so famous. It's like yeah. there's something very sexy about a dude that's that that knows smart, all this big shit and yeah. he knows all that shit. Yeah, you know what I mean. I get the difference that. with Tyson is that Tyson wasn't a wimp. Tyson yeah. was a wrestler. He he beat you up too. See, he's yeah, kinda, he he yeah, he's a big dude. Yeah, so he he's kind of full spectrum. I was just going to say, I was reading yeah. an article, too, about uh, Richard Feynman, who was, like, a very famous uh, physicist back in the day, and he was a pussy yeah. hound. Man, yeah. that fuck. Yeah. He was, like, he yeah. was a pickup artist before there were pickup artists. You know what I mean? He was doing all that shit. See, Tyson's special gift, gift was that he knows how to communicate. I mean, that guy can just deliver yeah. lines, and he's a, got a, he's got a fucking I read all his books. huge personality. You know what I mean? I, I mean, he's, he's not, funny the, he's not the nerdiest guy. You know, which I think that the nerdy guys actually do a lot of the really hard shit. They're, but they're so, they do, yeah. They're so socially awkward, you can't put them in front of the well, public. Well, the so thing about it is that... You put Tyson out there and you go, yeah, science. Science the shit out of this Tyson. <laughs> 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 the thing about it, and it's sad because people that are like really, really, really super intelligent, it's very rare for a person like that to also have like really good social skills. It's two things that don't usually go together. Sometimes yeah. they do, but that's a very rare individual. Yeah. It's it's two completely different. Right. It's two completely different like mental states, two different personality types, and I think genetically just those two things are not they they just very very rarely go together. Yeah. So I think that's why it's so rare like, you know, when you get a Carl Sagan, you get a Neil deGrasse Tyson, you get somebody that is super super intelligent but can also communicate well and is, you yeah. know, socially adept. Yeah, I mean, because... That's it, why it's such a big deal, because it doesn't happen that often. I'm basically a knucklehead. I, I, I really don't like um, nerds, you know what I mean? In that, in that way, I just, you know... <laughs> nerds! I'm, yeah, you know what I mean? When I was in Boston, I was, I was around the Ivy League, you know, students all the time. I'd see them at the club, you know, guys from MIT, and got, I, the fucking nerds, man. You don't you don't <laughs> want to be around them. It's, it's, it's almost like a disease, you know what I mean? But Tyson, I could hang with Tyson. 
I'm a nerd, I but I don't want to be around other I, nerds. Yeah, I don't want to be around. <laughs> Not necessarily. Oh, no, God, it's fucking problematic and shit. Well, it depends. Yeah, problematic. And I, you know, and I ran into nerds that back in the day had had experiments on the damn space show. Yeah. Yeah, I told you that story. Yeah, you right. did. Man, I couldn't stand to be around that dude. Some of them are... Couldn't stand to be around that dude. He just... just. Yeah. You ever seen Revenge of the Nerds? Of the course. nerdiest dude off of Friends of the Nerds? Yeah. It was fucking four times worse than that. I was embarrassed to be around a dude. <laughs> I started getting started getting like shy and shit. Like, like I, I gotta go. <laughs> you know? I, I can't imagine. It was almost I like it was almost like what do you, it was almost like uh, autism. Well, that was probably yeah, it's almost what like it was. autism. Yeah, I had to get the fuck out of there. That was probably he hung out at that same pizza place all the time. The same pizza place that you went to. Yeah, I'd go to there and he'd be in there all the time, want to hang out and shit. I said I gotta go. Yeah, Although I, I have to say, like I said, and I've mentioned this on the show it. before, it's like I'm I I can do all right, but I'm I find hang I'm I'm very introverted and I find hanging out with people very uh, tiresome. Uh, you know what I mean? Especially with people that are very boisterous and stuff. This bitch is lying. No, I'm just saying it's like you it put depends. her in a club. She's like a social butterfly. Well, yeah, but I know okay. those people. Yeah, okay, all right. If I have to, like, talk in front of people I don't know or anything, I mean, I know those people, like, I can talk to those people, that's cool, like, you know, what I mean? But it's like, if I have to, like, hang out with people I don't know or... We go, we go to the... Approach f- people I don't know, fuck that, I am not We went to a that. horror con and she was center of attention she, at the horror convention. And I hated it. She did I made him those fucking, panels and stuff like that. I made like him that, do so. it. Like, when the, he would go... Like, we would go to, like, what the fuck's it called? Screen Fest or whatever? No, no, Spooky Empire. A spooky Empire. It used yeah. to be called Screen Fest. Yeah. But he would go and, like, I would make him, it's like, I'm like, go, like, make people buy my book. I'm just going to sit here and be quiet. Because I'm not, I'm not good at, like, cold approaching. I'll sell every book she brought. He did, yeah. I could sell The every. first night, like, Friday night, he had sold them all. I'll sell every. Now, I got put on panels. Yeah. And... I could do that even though I was like super nervous beforehand and I needed to drink before I went up there because other than that, I I just get like really, really nervous and I worry that I'm going to say something dumb and I still worry about that when we're recording the show even though I could yeah. take it out if I wanted to, <laughs> even yeah. though I hardly ever do. Yeah. But yeah, so, all right, so let's get back to talking about Julia. So like I said, um, some people said she levitated. Uh, Wait, we're jumping right back into this bitch levitated. Yeah. What did I miss? Did I miss something? You did miss it because okay. I mentioned it a okay. long time ago. Okay, I must have. All See right. how you go? You just go off on these. Okay. Tangents I'm no, I'm fucking drinking. Then you man. forget what. Look, I'm, I'm starting to bang on all cylinders. So am I. And that shit here is strong. You're. Right. How long we've we been talking? I don't know. I'm trying to bet this is at two hours right there. Oh, an hour and eleven minutes. Right. Hour and eleven minutes. Almost, it's almost, almost time for we got to fucking wrap. We'll this do shit. a break in a minute. We got to wrap up the first. Yeah, half. we got to get to the face eating. Holy crap! We yeah, because the good part of the show is coming. Yeah, so some people said that she levitated off the bed, like I said, just like Reagan did in The Exorcist. Um, Gallagher, not so, but he didn't really mention it. Um, also said she had like the whole superhuman strength thing going on, like six people would try to restrain her and they couldn't. So um, evidently the Catholic Church came to the conclusion, yes, she is demonically possessed, so we need to do something about that. So they decided to do like some major rites of exorcism like they do. Now, some sources that I read said they did two exorcisms. Some said they did as many as eight. I'm not sure which one is correct. Um, But during these exorcisms, same kind of shit happened. She's like, you know, spewing blasphemous whatnot and like saying all kind of, you know, shit to the, to the priests that were attending her that like somehow, how could she know that? And I was, it was funny because we watched The Exorcist the other day and I was thinking, why you do this to me, Demi? Yeah. She was saying Demi. Shit, it was shit like that. Demi. <laughs> that was awesome. That, that was awesome. I love that movie. <laughs> What's so funny is how understated that movie is by today's standards. It but is, it, yeah. it was very effective back in the day. It was just fucking eerie. Well, yeah, it was something creepy They could creep you out with some little shit. Yeah. Because you could kind of believe the that creepiest, maybe they did have. The creepiest yeah. scene in that, I mean, aside from <coughs> the the whole crab walk thing that yeah. wasn't even in. like That wasn't in the normal cut. Release, that was like in the director's cut later yeah. on. Um, the creepiest scene in that to me is when um, Karis has the dream about his mom coming up the subway steps. And yeah. then turning around and going yeah, back see, down. Yeah, yeah. And when he comes in the room and sees, instead of Reagan, he sees his mom sitting on the bed in like this spotlight type that that 
that was to me that was the creepiest scene. I don't know why. Shit like that creeps me out. I don't know why. Demi, why you do this? Yeah, to when me, she started Demi. talking like in that woman's voice. You're not voice. my mother. <laughs> Whenever this is, and I don't know why this is. Like maybe somebody that has like some kind of psychology background can like let me know why the fuck this mm. freaks me out so much. Um, something that freaks me out in movies. One, what people uh, when people are in two places at once. That's why David Lynch movies freak me out so much because he does that kind of shit a lot. Um, and also when somebody starts talking in a different voice. <laughs> that's why the that's why the whole shit with um. Danny in The Shining, when yeah. he starts going, Brad, Rob! That's why that freaks me out. So, but yeah. The first time I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah. no. That, I don't know why that bothers me. It just bothers me. So when to, And that scene in The Others, where like she comes around, and it's like an old lady, and it starts talking in her daughter's voice. Oh, yeah. that freaked me out so bad. I don't yeah. know why. But yeah, so uh, so that when, when Reagan in The Exorcist starts talking in her, his mom's voice and stuff, and talking, he ta- uh, she talks in fucking... Uh, Burke's voice too. Yeah. Do you know what she did? Your yeah, hunting yeah, yeah, daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. That freaked me out too because yeah. I was like, oh, that's that guy. She threw out the window. Yeah. Oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> it's a masterpiece movie, and I think it's lost on young people today because they're just so desensitized, you know, with some of these like over the top horror movies. But there was just the kind of the subtlety of all the little build up of the original. Yeah, extras. subtle movies freak me out that we, more, that way more. It kind of affects us because I guess we the nostalgia factor probably also. Well, and stuff that's but, over the top. I think the problem with that is that the more you show like this gross, like gory shit, it's like I like yeah. watching that, but it just makes me laugh more than anything. It Another thing it doesn't bother me. Back in the day, you because it's just over the top and funny. And then you had to put yourself back in the day. Back in the day, we're watching this movie and it's being presented as a film yeah you know what i mean this isn't a flick this is a fucking with a film. capital with a, with a, yeah and as if it's real yeah that there's a certain that this really happened so there's something kind of formal about it you know what i mean like yeah so little things that would happen in it had a greater impact because you're taking the movie seriously almost kind of like it's a documentary you know yeah. what I mean? That's how well, I it did would... have that aspect. Yeah, you know. So it was plus, like, I have to like say, when I was a kid, I looked almost exactly like Linda Blair. You so did? like, it was, yeah. So yeah. So like, when I saw that movie, and like even later on, because my mom was like, "God, that looks just like you when you were a kid," and I was like, "Yeah, it does kind of does." Yeah, yeah, she looks just like that. Yeah. So anyway, all right. So they do. They're doing the exorcisms on Julia. She does the standard exorcism kind of stuff. There's like shit flying around, all this kind of stuff. All these like weird voices coming out of her. Um, now some of the witnesses said that while they were doing this stuff, um, it was really, really hot outside. I think it was June when they were doing it. Um, but the, the room got like super, super cold, just like in the exorcist that happened in that movie too. Um, but also there was another time too, where the room got so hot that everyone had to leave. Like it was just like a fucking heater in there. Now, Dr. Gallagher said that however many exorcisms they did, whether it was two, eight, whatever, um, that they did actually kind of help, but that she was still showing symptoms of having this kind of demon possession or having whatever it was that she was. Now, at some stage, Julia herself came to a point where she's like, I don't really want to continue with this, even though they weren't really done with the exorcism, because I guess, you know, <laughs> it takes more than one or whatever. Um, like I said, she she was very ambivalent about uh, approaching the church in the first place. So I guess that, you know, after they'd done a couple of these rites, she's like, fuck this, I'm not doing this anymore. Or maybe it doesn't bother me. Um, I think Gallagher later said that she said something to him uh, to the effect that um, I kind of like the power that I get from the demon and maybe I don't want him to leave. So I don't know mm-hmm. if that was a factor also. So she basically just fucked off. And um, I believe Gallagher didn't have any contact with her until a little bit later. They said the last time that he heard from her, she told him that she had cancer. I don't know how much longer, how much later this was than like after they had done the exorcisms. But she had cancer and she was kind of thinking about, oh, maybe I'll come back and finish the whole exorcism thing. But then she never came back and he never heard from her again. And he was kind of upset about it. Hmm. So... I guess she decided that she liked having the demon. So she just ran off with the demon. So she just ran off with it. Because like yeah, I said, I, I guess they, they weren't done. And like, yeah, yeah. they didn't, however many they did. I From what I heard, 
Like I said, some sources said, oh, as many as eight, but I think that's an exaggeration. What I heard was that they did one and completed it, and then it wasn't quite right, I guess. And so they said, well, we'll do another one, and they only get about halfway through the second one. And then she was like, I don't want to do it anymore, and she took off. That's what mm. I heard. So I don't know how she turned out. Like I said, I don't know what her real name was. Nobody knows except for him, presumably. So I don't know if she still got the demon and she's still running around out there somewhere. What was that movie that we watched the other day that was about... Oh, it was so funny. I think it was on Netflix or Shudder. I can't remember. But it was about uh, like a... It, it was like Alcoholics Anonymous, but it was for people that had been possessed by demons. I don't it was, remember that. It was called Ava's something. Ava's Exorcism or something like that. I don't, I like don't that. remember. It was really funny. It was like a horror comedy. And it was like a, a concept I'd never seen before. But it kind of reminded me of this because one of the women in the in the support group was just like, no, I, I like the demon. I want to keep it yeah. or I want to get it back. You know what I mean? It like, sounds like a poltergeist uh, Yeah, case, it definitely does me. sound like that. And it sounds like the girl ran off and kind of resol- resolved the poltergeist situation on her own. It burns out after after a certain Which amount of time. Which maybe that's what happened. Right. How, how long did this go on for? Oh, I don't know. Okay. It probably just resolved itself. It seemed like it wasn't a huge amount of time. I mean, okay. from the way he's talking about it. Yeah. So, you know. Okay. I don't know it's if he not wrote a book about not, it or something like no, that. But no dates are given, so we don't know. Like I said, it happened in 2008 as far as I know. Or that's when she first like approached the church okay. about it and they started doing the exercise. Well, if she's out there, she can fucking give us a call. I'd like to have her on. Yeah, I'm kind of, like, curious about right. what was happening with it. Yeah. Because, I mean, the fact that you got an actual, like, cert board-certified psychiatrist who had been yeah. to, like, Yale and shit to, like, come and go, I yeah, was I there. think she's possessed by demons. I was there, That's you know That's kind of I mean? a big deal. I had a, I had a similar thing happen to me, man. I was there, so, you know, I can speak your language. Yeah, I'm, we'll see what's I'm going. kind of curious as we'll to have what's going on, on with that. All right. All right, so uh, let's take a break right now, and when we come back from the break... What you've all been waiting for. We're talking about the face eating. It wasn't really eating. It was face tearing. Don't spoil it. Well, you already Just did let it, at the beginning okay. of the show. Okay. Oh, and there's much worse. Bunch of, yeah, it's a it, weird fucking Shit happened case. to the dog, too. Yeah, just that, just a trigger warning. It's like if, if you're if you're really you're sensitive. squeamish about the animals. Because I know that feeling. I, I get like that, too. And, and yeah. that's another thing that I was going to mention. Had, we had... We had somebody in the comments section saying that when they were little kids, the sister, they nailed the kitten to the fucking... That's what I was just going to say. I would fuck a motherfucker up behind that. This is America. This did that America. person later... Like, get back to me on this. Did did that person later become a serial killer? Your your uncle or whatever it was? Yeah, it, was it was their uncle, right? This is America. Their mom's brother. Yeah. This Nailing happened in England. To a this, tree. this was done in England. But if that had happened here, <sighs> motherfucker... I'd make you pay. My fuck my my ex husband's mom yeah. drowned a bunch of kittens in a bag. Like she yeah, threw you it know. in the river. And I was like Yeah. How can, and I said that this was, on that was whales, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I said yeah. this on the thing. I'm like, how I can't even step on a bug and not yeah. feel bad. It's like much less fucking holy shit. At how? Drowning, that's kind of rough, man. <sighs> how could yeah. you do that? Even in Mississippi, I heard, you know, even in Mississippi, I heard of just people just taking cats and fucking taking them far away and letting them go. You know I, mean, I mean, even that, like cats are, you, unless they're super yeah. little, it's like they they can usually like take care of themselves. Yeah, become feral. Yeah. Yeah, it's like so. I would rather like why kill them? That just sense. put them in a box, take them far away. It's like you know, you well, go live somewhere. It was probably, probably in a, be all right. probably in a built up area. Ugh. Probably in a built-up area or a suburban. Just area. let them be stray cats. Yeah. Why do you gotta kill them? I don't get yeah. it. I don't get it. Shut it down. Shut it down. All right. So we're gonna take a break right now. When we get back, we're going to talk about the case of Michael Taylor. This happened in a little town called Osset in Yorkshire, and it's pretty fucked up. So you'll want to <laughs> say so you'll want to stay tuned through the break. We'll be back in just. A-
significant because we are willing to put pen to paper and conclude at the end of the day that this house is very much haunted and will continue to be haunted for a very long time. See, that's what that warm laundry does. That's what that warm laundry does to you, huh? What do you say about that, baby cookie? You like to be in the laundry? Yeah. You like to be in the laundry? She, as soon as I dumped it out, she was like, jumped right in, in the bed. laundry. I'm going to cover you up. I'm going to cover you up. <laughs> cover you up like that. Now what? <laughs> now what? <laughs> now what? like, what? Nothing. I'm just going to sit in here. Nothing, huh? Just going to sit there? What you got to say? Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible. Chilling with the laundry. It's incredible. <laughs> Is it good? Nice and warm. Warm laundry. Going to sleep. <laughs> Going to sleep on the warm laundry. Yeah. Yawning. Yeah. That's just relaxing, isn't it? Kramer thought the same thing. <laughs> Kramer put that shit in the damn oven to warm it up. Yeah. The Faceless Villain, a collection of the eeriest unsolved murders of the 20th century, volume two, includes cases spanning the years from 1960 through 1979, featuring such infamous crimes as the triple homicide at Lake Bodum, the family massacre known as the Good Heart Murders, the serial killings of the Zodiac, Bible John, Jack the Stripper, and the Freeway Phantom. The slaughter of dozens of women and girls along the Highway of Tears and the Texas Killing Fields. And the mysterious death of suspected spy, the Isdal Woman, along with dozens of other fascinating and horrifying accounts. Buy it now from Amazon in print, Kindle, or audiobook format. All right, we are back from the break. Now we're going to talk about the face ripping just like we promised this is also another case of demon possession which i kind of talked about in you just my... called it the face ripping yeah that's, that's what some it funny is. Some shit. Okay. <laughs> the face ripping this is fucked up you guys this is fucked up this is a weird weird case yeah might be something to this and like i said you know this has been requested a couple times and you know finally i decided yeah we'll finally talk we'll talk about it on the show because i did write about it in my book and it, it seemed like it needed yeah i'm just saying now I think there might be something to both of these cases. That first one, to me, that sounded like poltergeist. poltergeist yeah, I don't phenomenon. think either of these are demon possession, no. but I, I think there's two different per- things going on th- in these cases, though. I'm going to call it bio-paranormal. Okay. It's paranormal that comes from living creatures. Trademark. Like that shit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Okay. So this case here, this stems from 1974. This is the case of Michael Taylor also known as the Osset Exorcist Murder. Now, let's set the scene a little bit. So Osset is this little bitty town uh, located near the town of Wakefield in West Yorkshire in England. Now, at the time, it was a fairly small town, I'm guessing, uh, just kind of, you know, kind of place where it was just a very small town. Everyone's just kind of like, doing their shit everyone's going to church everyone's doing doing their small town shit yeah doing small town shit yeah and uh you would never imagine that something of this magnitude of the horror yeah in their small town whatever kind of like john cougar mellencamp it's like yeah this is like the british equivalent of john John cougar Cougar mellencamp fucking some pink houses kind of shit going on i'm imagining that yeah so if anybody, if, some John if you guys lived in the in West Yorkshire in 1974 <laughs> and can clarify, please let me know. So the family that lives in this little town consists of Michael Taylor, who was 31 years old at the time. He had a wife named Christine. They had five children. Uh, they also had a little dog. Like every family did. I, th- I believe it was a poodle. I think uh, some other sources said it was a poodle. So their neighbors consider them a completely normal, happy, completely normal family. There's like nothing weird going on over there. There's, there's no violence, no fights, no nothing like that. It was just completely normal. Couple, their five kids, their dog, whatever. 
They said the only thing that was unusual was that Michael Taylor, the the patriarch, I guess you would call it, of the family, um, he seemed like a very quiet, like, mild-mannered type of dude. Um, now, he had had a back injury at some stage in the past, so he had been... I don't know if he was out of work all this time, but he, you know, was finding uh, finding it hard to find, like, long-term work because, you know, he had so much trouble with his back. So he had kind of fallen into depression that kind of came and went, which, you know, understandable. So there was that whole thing going on. But uh, other than that, most of the neighbors said that was pretty much the only unusual thing, that he had kind of bouts of depression stemming from his injury. Now, at this point in time, as I said, it was 1974, the residents of this town, um, fairly religious, as particularly by English standards, it seems to me, um, most of the residents of the village, like, went to church on Sunday, uh, you know, like they would. But despite that fact, uh, the Taylor family, not so much into the church thing. They did, usually didn't go. They didn't really seem to care about it. They were very meh on relig religion in general. Now, after this, you know, so this whole situation is going on. Now, they had um, a friend of the family, and her name was Barbara Wardman. And she got it into her head that maybe she could kind of help out with Michael Taylor's depression by kind of getting him into religion or getting him back, you know, coming to church and everything regularly and whatnot. Getting back right with the Lord. That's uh, yeah, what they call ex that exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was her yeah. thinking. Get right with the Lord. So she decides that she is going to kind of introduce him to this church group that she is a part of. Now, the church group was called the Christian Fellowship Group. And forgive me if this is offensive, but from what I'm reading about it, it seems a little culty. Just just saying. It seemed, it seemed a little culty. So, but... This this Barbara person was, like, super into it, and she thought that it would help his depression. So, you know, I guess her intentions were honorable. Let me so, back up for a second, All though. right, we're backing up for a second. All right, you're saying this <laughs> sounds a little culty. Yeah, it sounds a little culty. The thing they is, were doing though, the is whole that... speaking in tongues, and I don't know if they the... were, like, handling snakes or drinking strychnine. The thing or, is, I don't though, think is to that, that extent, but... cult has a negative connotation. It really just means a little religion, really. That's a, it's a little religion. Yeah, and but I'm using actually, it in its negative I know that, but I'm just trying to explain to the audience. Really, Christianity is a series of a bunch of little cults. It is. Because there's so many of these little, there's there's denominations. You know, you got Greek Orthodox, you got you got Russian Orthodox, you got Catholic, Protestant, and then in the Protestant religion, well, the Protestant denomination, you got thousands of little tiny Baptists and all these little, and you can break it on down to these little private do-it-yourself churches 20, 30 people, you can say that that's a cult, that it's a Christian cult. Yeah. It's not negative. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. It's just, you know what I mean? I'm just trying to make the audience understand that Christianity really is a, is, is a huge group of little a, tiny cults. A series cults. of cults, <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's really what it is. All, I and, think all major religions Yeah, are they're all kind of cult. like that. You're right. Yeah, they're all little cults. Well, because... They're all... Islam, really... There's two different denominations, well, actually three different denominations. You know, you got, uh, what do you call them, the Shia, you got the Sunni, and you also have the um, the Sufi, okay? And there's different little groups inside this. You could say that's a bunch of different cults, too. Well, to be so, honest with you, with any human endeavor, any human organization of any kind, religious or otherwise, you are never going to get more than, let's say, 20 people to agree, agree on, on one shit. thing. <laughs> yeah. So even if you have a congregation, let's right. say, of a thousand people, right. those people are going to like go off in like four or five little yeah. factions because that's just how humans do, man. Yeah, I mean, you, you got... You, 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 you can't keep people to agree on shit. You even have an American version of Christianity. Like, of course. The thing that busted off of Protestantism and a, a totally American version of the shit, Mormonism. Yeah, which, which we're going to have to do a show totally about. new... You know, Book of Mormon. You know, you got new scriptures, the new Genesis. You know, yeah. Joseph I found Smith I found these, these golden guys. plates in the ground, the and it's like I don't know what happened to them. Though. The Angel like, Maroni and yeah. everything, and the magic glasses. <laughs> I can't show them to you though. Every <laughs> every one of these damn now, some people say, well, that's some hokey shit. Okay, <laughs> the thing is, is that it's all hokey shit. All all well, the all the literature of all from. these groups. 
it all kind of is suspect. You know what I mean? It just sounds strange to us because you 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 say, well, you know, Mormon, the Mormons, that was eighteen hundreds. Well, that was just yesterday. You know, I mean, that's the way yeah, you look at it. Yeah, I do feel it. like, well, I think You this add is, another couple thousand years on it, and that shit will sound awful where, official. This right. is kind of where the whole, like, ancient mysteries, yeah. uh, ancient aliens, and all that kind of stuff comes from. Because people tend to think, like, the older something is, like, the more Remember? venerable, the more, you know, the more legit it is. Mm. But it's like, people back then were just dumb fucks, just like we are now. Yeah, go back. If you new listeners, like go back and, and, and listen to uh, Dr. Price. We had Dr. Robert Dr. Robert Price on here, you know, and he that dude's a fucking hardcore scholar of all of these scriptures. Okay, even Islam, he studied that too. All these religions kind of have kind of. But I find that fascinating. Kinda, I find yeah. well, I find the I find it fascinating just because I find it fascinating how humans. Their brains go in particular yeah. directions. Yeah. And so I feel like across different cultures, no matter how far apart the cultures are, they tend to come up with similar ideas right. to explain certain aspects it's of all, nature, let's say. It's all a certain genre of literature. It's religious literature. Yeah. And it's a certain genre. And even in modern days, you have that happening now with like the Marvel MCU. Is really, when you look at the bare bones of it, it's religious literature. Yeah, you know, I, a I, couple I, thousand years from now, that. the MCU is very much like the Greek pantheon. You know, very. Yeah, much. there's really no difference. And yeah. well, shit, it borrows from that, and you know, yeah. it's it's an endless cycle. And if you really trace it mythology. back, there wasn't any real difference between the Greek pantheon and the Canaanite pantheon that the Old Testament came from. So like I all said, like the human shit. brains tend yeah. to all. I mean, no right. matter where you're from, no matter where you're born, they all tend to run in similar channels. So yeah. you're going to get similar shit like showing up. So that's our statement place. about religion. I fucking love religion. I think the shit's interesting. Do I think it's true? It is interesting. Do I think it's true? There's some truth in it. There's some stories in it. And there's some lessons in it. And yeah, there's, there's some truth. Is it true in the way that the faithful think it's true? Yeah, nah. No. Not maybe. No. No. But it like depends. I said, it's, it depends. It's, you, can say, you can say, well, the Bible. Okay, what does the Bible say? The Bible says a lot of stuff. It says a lot of things. And each one of them, you got to take each little thing on its own. And, um, you know, my studies of Islam, too, and the three books that they use, they mostly use three books. But, uh, you know, it's kind of the same thing. Is it true? Eh, depends on how you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I kind of feel it. Depends that. on what your definition of truth so, is. So, whether this group was right. a cult, like I said, it, it had some, like, culty aspects in the, in the um, context of cult that most people understand it nowadays, where, you know, it's like kind of a, like a Scientology or, or a weird type thing. Now, this particular congregation was led by a 21-year-old woman by the name of Marie Robinson. Now, even though Michael Taylor had previously not given a single whiff of a shit about religion, wait a minute, he didn't give a single whiff of a shit. Not even a shit. There's a shit it was there. A there's a whiff, whiff coming of off it. You, God, you know damn. what I mean? It's you like I don't give a shit, word. like a handful of shit. But you I don't a... even give like if you if it was over there and you were damn. smelling it, I don't even give that much of it. That's what you I'm have saying. a way with words. You ought to write books for a living. Yeah, I should. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for recommending yeah, that. I'll, right. I'll look into that possibility. Okay. All right, yeah. Yeah. So he didn't give a shit about religion before, but suddenly, ever since he gets into this particular religious group with this 21-year-old pastor who happens to be a female. I, okay. don't, know, I don't know what she looked like. I she knew you were going to say that. She might have been super hot, yeah. Uh, I knew, he thought she was hot, man. Or, seriously, or he okay. thought she was hot, whether yeah. she was, like, you know, objectively hot or not. I don't know. Is there such a thing? Probably not. So he starts getting super into religion suddenly. Yeah. So he goes to the group. He like gets all up. He gets all up into it. He says, "Yeah, I'm speaking in tongues. I'm all, I'm all yeah. about it." And so him and Marie, they start spending a lot of time together. Now, yeah. by most accounts, they were just doing like religiousy shit. Like, they were, like, making the sign of the cross at each other. Like, I'm well, getting all the did. demons out of you. I'm getting the demons out of you. But, you know, this is the 21st century. Everybody knew probably they were fucking. Yeah, I'm going to get the demons out of you, but I'm going to put this devil in you. 
This big demonic Were whale. Were they fucking? I don't know. I Leviathan, wasn't there. I didn't comes. film that shit. I okay. wasn't there. I'm just saying. Okay. I wasn't there seeing if they were I understand fucking. What you're saying. I understand. But. You know, we're all adults here. This all goes back to unless like, there are children listening, which I hope yeah. there are not. But this all goes back to the Baker clan and everything, you know, with Tammy Faye. Yeah. You know how they were. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I I think they were fucking, but maybe they weren't. Yeah. Maybe they legitimately were thinking they were like exercising some demons or whatever. Good. Okay. Um, but as we will soon find out, that shit didn't work out. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, so they spend uh, they start spending an awful lot of time together doing uh, their religiousy stuff, exercising demons and whatnot. Um, and other members of the congregation start to notice. Also, um, Michael Taylor's wife Christine obviously starts to notice too. She's like, "Hey, you're uh, spending an awful lot of time with this 21 year old woman, yeah. exercising demons, quote unquote, or whatever the yeah. fuck it is oh, you he's were doing." Oh, exercising some demons, all right. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So maybe she's getting a little upset about that, understandably. So, um, also at this stage, they said that his personality started to change. He had previously been a pretty laid back dude, like you know, very mild mannered, very gentle, nice type of guy. Um, you know, kind of dude you'd always want to hang out with. But at this point, after he starts hanging out with this other chick, he starts getting really irritable. He starts getting kind of crabby. It's like he doesn't really want to spend time with his family anymore. He just always wants to be, you know, with the church group and always doing church kind of stuff. Um, you know, started exhibiting just erratic behavior, just kind of like these weird, bizarre beliefs. Like he was kind of going off the deep end. Now, during one meeting, because Christine had been, I mean, she joined the congregation too. They had both been, and in some sources I read said that she was actually a member of the congregation first before Michael Taylor was, and then he came into it late and then got like way more into it than she was. So at one meeting of the congregation, Christine decides, uh, that's the wife in case you had forgotten, um, you know, she's going to confront everybody about this bullshit that's been going on. So she pretty much, in front of everyone, she pretty much accuses Michael Taylor and Marie Robinson. They're like, are you guys fucking? What the fuck is going on? Um, and, and all this other stuff. So there was like a confrontation. Now, at this stage, this is kind of weird because... And, and several members of the congregation have attested to this going on. So Christine confronts him about, are you having an affair with her? What the fuck is going on? And he starts to have essentially a mantrum. A mantrum. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a man tantrum. That's a man tantrum. Okay. Yeah, uh, obviously. Right. So you had your own word for that. Yeah. That's the masculine what... version of a tantrum. Well, a tantrum, when I say tantrum, that usually means a child. But if it's a grown man, <laughs> okay, okay. It, then I it's like a mantrum. I like how you spawn that. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to let it slide. No, I'm just saying. Okay. A mantrum. It's a mantrum. It's kind of like if a, if, if a guy. <laughs> <laughs> if a guy doesn't think he's big enough, he's got manorexia. Right? Yeah. He's got manorexia. Okay. That's that's when he gets like super obsessed with making yeah. himself bigger. Whereas like right, if you yeah. have anorexia, you're whether small. you're a man or you're a woman, you're not small enough. You're not small enough, you're not so small you're trying enough. to like starve yourself. Manorexia, is, manorexia <laughs> is somebody that I didn't make that up. I just, I read that somewhere else. <laughs> Look at this cat. Yeah, she's, what the fuck you doing? Come here. She's fucking around. Come here. Mantrum. I don't know if I made that up okay. or if I just I don't know. That just seemed like a very obvious epithet. But yeah, so he has a mantrum now. Interestingly, like he starts acting like super weird and like flipping out and stuff. Now, interestingly, instead of attacking his wife, who was actively accusing him in front of everybody of essentially, I don't know if she used these words. She probably didn't, obviously. What are this you doing? Cat, this cat. You guys got to see this shit. What the fuck are you doing? doing? What the fuck are you doing? Get out of here. She's like, not, not no, I'm not doing anything. Yeah, she's like trying to like play that shit off. Yeah, trying to play it off. I wasn't doing anything. Yeah. So instead of like attacking his wife, who was the one actively accusing him at the time, he decides to go after Marie, the 21-year-old. There she See, goes now again. she's moving the camera. Oh, she's going to push it off. Are down. you done? Are you done? 
<laughs> playing with cameras oh, and shit. Oh, you're being such a brat. Good. She is being right. such a bad girl. Right. Okay. Sorry for that, you guys. <laughs> she just has to be on the show. She has yeah. to be, like, involved. Yeah. She doesn't like it if she's not involved. So, yeah, so Michael Taylor decides instead of going after his wife, who was actively accusing him at the time, he's going to go after Marie, the 21-year-old pastor of the congregation who he's supposedly super in love with. So he goes after Marie. He starts fucking screaming at her, beating on her, all this other kind of shit. So all these other members of the congregation are like, what the fuck, man? And they, like, jump on him and they have to, like, pull him off of her and, like, restrain him and shit. And they think that he's just, like, losing his fucking marbles at this point. Now, Marie later said of this whole debacle, she said that, you know, I looked at the guy, she said his whole, uh, you know, the whole contour of his features changed. She said he looked bestial, quote unquote, that he looked mm. like an animal said he kept looking at me and there was a really wild look in his eyes. I started screaming at him. She started speaking in tongues. Is she saner than him? I guess she mm -hmm. didn't kill anybody later, but you know what I mean. She still had that thing going on. She says, uh, Mike, which is what she called him, also screamed at me in tongues. I was on the verge of death and I seemed to come to my senses. Now she says that the only way that she got him to stop beating on her and screaming at her, whatever it was she was doing, she just kept yelling, like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus at him. Yeah. Because that's what they always that's say. What you gotta do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so she says, oh, thank, you know, thank God that I wasn't killed. He might have killed me and stuff, which, you know, he yeah. very well may have, considering Consider what, what happened later, yeah, yeah. later on. Now, when uh, Michael Taylor was kind of snapped out of the fugue that he went into i guess like uh, pr uh after this incident he said that he didn't remember any of it i don't know if that's true or not but that's what he said anyway so the next day he goes back to the congregation and he says you know i don't remember any of it and all of the um congregants there actually forgave him and gave him like an absolution because that's, That's what, what they do. do? Yeah. I don't know. It's like, I want to say, oh, they're better people. Maybe they're, they just, more it away. they're just more naive people. Perhaps. They prayed it away. They prayed it away. <laughs> they prayed it away. Now, they it's did. like praying the gay away. But they believe yeah. you can do it, but you can't. You can't, you can't pray. Do it. But away. yeah, you can't, you no. can't pray away uh, face ripping either. No, no, no. Especially in this case. Mm. So even though they did say that they forgave him, they did the whole like trust but verify thing because they said, okay, well, we're still going to keep an eye on this motherfucker because we don't know like what he's capable of. He may be crazy. We're not, we're not quite sure. So as time goes on, uh, both his wife and other members of the congregation note that his behavior is just getting worse and worse. Um, as I said, he was a very nice, mild-mannered person before, but now that he has become involved with this cult, become involved with Marie Robinson, he is just getting, like, crazier and crazier. crazier. His behavior is becoming stranger and stranger, more violent. He's going into these outbursts and all this other kind of shit. Now, at this stage, um, some members of the congregation and some other, like, kind of pastors that were, like, adjacent to this little religious group... They decide, well, maybe he has been uh, subjected to demonic forces. Perhaps he is possessed, uh, maybe. So we he's should do... That cat's back in that closet yeah. fucking up. See, hey, every, every time we record the show, she's like, why are you guys yeah. not paying attention to me right it's now? It's hot. It's hot. It's the summer, and she doesn't want to go outside, so she can't blow off steam. It's like a little kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? She, she's not I mean, asked to go out. Yeah. In case you don't know, like we've mentioned before, we live in Central Florida. It's like Dagobah. It is hot as fucking yeah. balls here right yeah. now. Uh, and humid as balls also. So previously, during the winter, she will, little Pookie will go outside and yeah. she'll run around in the yard for a couple hours and then she'll be fine and she'll come back in. She'll be like, yeah, I got on my I killed some bugs. I did some shit and, you know. Hey, but when it's summer... She does not want to go outside because yeah, it's so miserable to... outside. So she will just stay in here. Yeah, and mess with us. <laughs> and yeah. climb all over our right, feet. Yeah. And just, which, you know, she just wants to be involved in what mommy or daddy are doing. That's all right. Mommy and daddy, as if we gave birth to a cat. I can't understand it. It's only girls come up with this shit. 
Hey, you. It's call a your, cat. You call yourself daddy too. Don't just. Well, don't just. I'm just joking though. You sound like you're serious. Okay, okay. but that's what. Just earlier, we were like putting the laundry away, and he's like, "Go see mommy, go see mommy." And <laughs> yeah, I like, guess I was. Wasn't yeah, it? you were. And then, and then you like but you made, got me to do that. You like made me sound crazy. Okay. Okay, I know how you do. All right. I know. Hey, how you do. stop it. <laughs> All right. So, like I said, they start to think, well, maybe there's a demon possessing him. Maybe that's what's wrong. So they uh, they consult the local vicar. And they decide that, that maybe they should do an exorcism. So they get two ministers, and I guess they were both from around there. One of them, and this cracks me up, his name was Father Peter Vincent, which if you guys have seen Fright Night from 1985, that was the name of the vampire killer that was played by Roddy yeah. McDowell. His name was Peter so. Vincent. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this was a real guy named okay. Peter Vincent. They didn't get the name from Fright Night. It was a real guy. And then there was another guy named Reverend Raymond Smith, and they were brought in to do an exorcism on Michael Taylor. So they were going to do it at midnight for whatever reason. I guess that's the same reason like why in movies it's like, oh, we're going to turn off his life support at midnight. We're going to do the exorcism Gives at midnight. Gives it more because, Yeah, because it's like more like we're a horror do it movie, at I guess. Okay. As the day doth change to night. It's going to be some shit. <laughs> or the day changes to the next day. Yeah, some yeah, kind of like, like, yeah, that, whatever. Yeah. I don't know. So they're going to do it at midnight on October 5th, 1974. And this is at a church in Barnsley. So I guess there were like a bunch of other congregants there and they were kind of watching it. So the two ministers start just get, they get stuck in and they're doing the whole exorcism on Michael Taylor, trying to rid him of whatever uh, demons it was. So it goes all throughout the night and they're trying to get rid of uh, the demons. Now, as soon as they start doing the ritual, Michael starts doing your standard exorcism stuff. He starts like spitting and biting and swearing at them. And they eventually ended up having to tie him down because he was just thrashing everywhere and like smacking everyone. Um, so the first exorcism lasts like eight hours. He's, um, they're doing shit to him like, you know, they're fucking throwing holy water on him. They're sticking crucifixes in his mouth and all this other kind of stuff. I thought you were going to say he'd stick it in his ass. I was ahead. thinking that too because when I was yeah. reading like some because like I said I, I wrote about that this case. That might be more effective. Stick that it's like stick it up his head. butt. It's like ow! It's like surprise the <laughs> demon out of him. Hey, no butt stuff. <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. But yes. Yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's extra yeah. So yeah, so there's stuff and stuff in his mouth. As far as I know, I don't they might have stuck it in his butt and they just don't want to tell anybody. But so, you know, he's acting all, all animalistic, like growling at them and whatnot. So now okay. at this point and this oh, she's doing it. I don't again. know where is she? I don't know. Okay. Oh, I know where she went. She went under the desk. There's oh, okay. like a shelf in the desk and she was okay. fucking around in there with all some right. old shit. I got you. All right. So the two priests come to the conclusion, and this is some Warren's level shit right here. They come to the conclusion that Michael Taylor is inhabited by not one, not two, not even three, but 40 demons. Yeah, like 40, the 40 thieves, like Alibaba and the 40 That's thieves. what I mean. 40 yeah. is a nice round number, right? Yeah. If you're going to have demons in you, you, just, you don't just want Make one or 40. two. You just want 40 of them, because that's how it goes. Now, each of these demons... Uh, apparently had a different function, I guess. So, got your demon of uh, bestiality, got yeah. your demon of carnal knowledge, got your be got your demon of heresy, got your demon of masochism. You got a demon for each letter. These are very, very specific, low-level demons. It's funny that there's a... They each have one little area that they specialize in, and you need a whole bunch of them to possess one person to get the whole range of activities I guess I don't know how any of this works <laughs> yeah. what's funny is that there was a demon of bestiality and I recall reading a book about demonology and there were some comments on it they said that there, there were a lot of you know transcripts from from like uh, inquisitions that happened on yeah. You know what I mean? From supposedly, you know, possessed type people. This is right. back in the, you know, 1600s. And evidently, the, uh, one of the questions was, is, you know, did you have sex with animals? And they always ask girls this. 
had he been having sex with the animals. Because they were fantasizing. Yeah, there was something weird. That it didn't, evidently, the old... Please tell me you fucked a horse. Please yeah, tell me you fucked yeah, a horse. Evident, <laughs> evidently, you know, the, some of the commentary was is that that a lot, of, a lot of the priests back in the day were very interested to find out whether or not these young women were having sex with animals. Oh, I'm sure they were very yeah. interested. We have, <laughs> we have porn for that now. Yeah. <laughs> whether, it makes you wonder, you know what I mean? Now, there were a couple cases where, you know, guys admitted to having sex with, with, with animals and they killed him and the animal. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't recall any of the readings that I came across with some of those old books whether or not a woman was actually ever caught red-handed having sex with these animals. This sounded like some priests were making up. They're wondering, are you having sex with them? Yeah, animals? like, I could see how... Because, look, it's, you know, there's a handful of freakazoids nowadays yeah. that are into, like, bestiality. Into that, yeah. I, like, I've seen some of those websites, and, yeah. like, not on purpose or anything, but it's like, I've seen a couple of those. So I know there's people that it's into that. But it's going to be, like, a way smaller percentage than people that fantasize about other people doing it. Yeah. Which there's is why there's porn of it nowadays in the first. There place. seems to be, there seems to have been kind of like in the demonology racket, you know, in France yeah. and England. Yeah, the, yeah. the priests were very because it was a racket. Yeah, it was a racket. You know, I mean, the, the priests were very interested in people's sex lives. You know, they wanted to know. Like I said, they didn't have internet porn back then. No, it's weird. It's weird. So they had to get their jollies somewhere. Yeah, they had to have something that they could think back on later on when they were jerking it. Well, I think. <laughs> I think you know what I, I mean. Oh, might, that that maiden we're probably putting, was we're, fucking we're a horse. Probably kind of projecting, no. probably projecting modern mentality into it. I, I, I do. I not think, think, think they, so. I think there was a lot of curiosity about. The I subject. do not think so. We'll see. I well, honestly, I think that people back then, yeah, there was a lot of differences, but I think in that aspect, I think people back then were just the same. I think I think a lot of these priests were. We're, we're imagining people to be more, you know what I mean, wild than they were. I think there was some wild shit going well, on. Well, yeah. I mean, I think fucked they, up shit goes on, yeah, but I think but people think it's more like, common than it yeah. is. So I think people think, oh, it's like, you know. It must be pretty bad. So we're Like these be, beautiful 20-year-old yeah, maidens were out there in the barn just like having the horses. Yeah, like, they're, yeah they got to be. Because, you know. Like rail them. That's the way they're thinking. But that's, yeah, that's what they wanted to think. Yeah. Was that happening? Maybe in like a tiny percentage, but not as often as the priest would have liked it yeah. to have occurred. Maybe they sure. maybe they read about it happening somewhere else. And, and then they were like. And they were like, oh, oh well, this must be a common practice. And they got all like tiddly Among, among women it. that are possessed. You know what I mean? Something like that. Weird. I just they made up all that kind of shit just out of their like weird imagination. They could, they didn't have access to the raw data. Like I said. they didn't have access to the raw data. So they could just like kind so of extrapolate sure. whatever the yeah, fuck they wanted exactly, to. Exactly. That's and the, it could just like line up with whatever they were kind of into at yeah. the time. And it's like they didn't want that to say easily, that could easily fucking that could easily end up being we gotta stop these women from having sex with all these animals. That well, could, I think could, that's exactly what that, happened. The, yeah, that, that, that's 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 that's. How I it think happened. that most of those like these all those damn fucking, women having sex. Yeah, with like all, all these those women animals. that got like taken like for witchcraft and shit. Yeah. You don't really you don't think that like the priests were like listening to all their like confet like after they tortured these yeah, poor girls. Yeah, yeah. And they were like coming up like, like yeah whatever what do you want to hear like, and they were just like making up stories yeah. and then they're like oh those dirty bitches yeah, and then they went back to their fucking rooms later on and they were oh jerking it under the fucking that's what they were doing. Yeah, maybe. Like, Maybe. Of course, they were. Bitches of course are bad. they were. Of course they were. Yeah. What are their fucking reasons? Well, they were having be? sex with women too. I mean, we had these priests back in the day were having sex with women. They had. Yeah, but like they I had, said, they had. They might have been having sex with women. And it was like boring, but it's yeah. like they were kind of thinking of like all. They weren't this supposed kind of to like have bullshit. sex, but they were having under, undercover sex with nuns. Yeah. They had. They had stuff going on in orphan. Their children were in orphanages. They had all. It was a racket. That's what I mean. It was, it was all kind of horrible shit going on back then. Documented. This is documented. Oh, I'm not yeah. making this up. Yeah. So, all right. So, they're doing this exorcism on Michael Taylor. And I think we got into the whole thing because we were, like, talking about sticking crucifixes up. Yeah. And stuff. Or demons of bestiality. What's the time? Really, I don't know. Okay. Don't. No, it just feels like it's been hours. No, it hasn't. Okay. Just, you don't, you, don't, you have, like, some weird time distortion. Thing yeah, I'm drunk. Well, so am I, but no. I, don't, I don't have a time distortion. Okay. I, okay. So, you're saying you have a better grasp of the space-time continuum. Yes. Than I do. Yes. Even when you're inebriated. Yes. Okay. 
Well, that is a documented... You people heard that, that shit. That is a documented fact. You people heard that shit. All right. Remember so I they, told you she becomes Spock when she gets drunk? No, I'm just saying. I'm still so, Kirk. God damn it. <laughs> Go fuck some green chicks. I'm, I'm, I'm Kirk. 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 So they do this eight-hour exorcism on this dude, sticking crucifixes in his orifices. Not his butthole, as far as I know, but <laughs> but maybe. I don't know. Okay. So they said that during this first exorcism, which just plumb wore them out, you guys, um, they had to stop because they were all tired. Because it really takes it out of you, like yelling at a person that's strapped to the floor, I guess. Now, they said that they were able to rid him... Of most of the demons. Yeah. Okay. However, and I'm not really sure how they know this, so I, so don't, like, ask me. But apparently, three of the demons that were still in there, like, they were able to run out the bestiality one, the blasphemy one, yeah. and, like, kind of all your lower, you know, your minor league demons. Right, yeah. They ran all of those out, supposedly. But the ones they left in there were three demons specifically these were the insanity demon the anger demon and the murder demon which you think you'd want to get those out first those are the hardest ones to i mean out. why don't you leave like okay if you're doing an exorcism just yeah. saying pro tip if you're doing an exorcism why don't you like start with the big ticket demons like get yeah. your murder demons out get your like fuck get all that shit out no you get like the... you can leave like the jaywalking demon in there <laughs> you can leave like the fucking illegal parking demon probably or whatever they're, just, uh, they're, just... Get, they're getting the, the easy demons out first the I they're, guess. That's what they're doing. They get the easy demons. But they were just like, oh, well, there's only three demons left. They're like the worst yeah. ones, but we're they're so... They're saving those for the last. We're so tired, you guys. It's like, yeah. I really have to go home and watch Netflix and have a drink and put my feet up. I can't deal with this anymore. Yeah. So we're just going to leave this poor dude with these three, the three worst demons, and we're going to leave them in there. Well, those are the ones they couldn't get out. I guess. Okay. That's what they'll tell you anyway. Right. I'm just, so what I'm, happened? I'm not buying it. So they said, okay, well, we'll continue the exorcism tomorrow because these three demons are still in there and these are the worst ones, so we have to get them out. Yeah. Now, apparently there was a woman and uh, she was one of either one of the congregants or like the wife of one of the ministers or something. And her name was Margaret Smith. And she came forth to two of the exorcists and she said, you guys, you really have to like continue the exorcism. Get these three out because I think something really, really bad is going to happen. All those demons are still in there. He's going to kill his wife. Evidently, she did warn them of this ahead of time. And the priests were like, man, we just, we, we can't do it anymore. We just have to yeah. go home and sleep. We can't take it. So they left it. And they said, well, we'll continue this tomorrow after everyone's rested. So... As you can probably tell, this did not end well. Yeah. Lay it on us, Jenny. So about 9.45 the yeah. following morning, which was October 7th, 1974, this was two hours after Michael Taylor and his wife Christine had gone home to rest for presumably the next exor exorcism where the three worst demons would be, it would be, you know, exited from his body. So there's a police patrol car... It's kind of driving through the streets, doing its regular little rounds or whatever in Osset in West Yorkshire. And they see a naked man running down the middle of the street, just covered from covered in blood from head to toe. All right. So thinking this is a little unusual. Right. They stop and ask him, man, what's the deal? And he starts screaming and ranting and stuff. This is the blood of Satan. So obviously this is not good. Now, as they're talking to this man, like a bunch of other townsfolk come around and they said, hey, that's Michael Taylor. They just exercised him and now he's running around naked, covered in blood. So they give the police his home address. Now, this cop car goes to the home address. Now, by the time they get to his home address, there's already another cop car that had been called by neighbors who had been worried about some kind of commotion like coming from the so, house. So they're earlier. already converging on So they're house. already converging on yeah. this house. Now, 
The cops go in there, and just like in the movies, the first cop that goes into the house immediately runs back out and throws up. And he ba- and here's the quote. I don't know if this is accurate, but I found this quote like online of what what the, what the first cop said like to the next cop like that he didn't want them to go in there. He says, "You don't want to see this one, son." Yeah. <laughs> I've seen nothing like it before, and I've seen a few. It's the wife. She's got no. And then there's like an elliptical. <laughs> like yeah. he doesn't want to tell what the fuck happens. He's like, "There's not much of her left. Mm-hmm. You don't want to see it." So, eventually, obviously, since they're cops, they have to go in the house. What they find when they go in there, the complete, the the whole living room, the whole front room of the house is just completely destroyed. There's shit everywhere. There's just broken stuff, broken furniture, everything. There's blood everywhere. There is pieces of brain everywhere. There's pieces of little gobbets of flesh everywhere. On the floor of the living room is the body of Christine Taylor, the wife of Michael Taylor. Also, their pet poodle. Now, Christine... Bestiality, see. uh, Well, I don't think he fucked the dog. I think he just killed it. What, 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 what was now, the, the blood what? that was all... Now, when they found Michael Taylor running around in the street, like, naked and covered in blood, that wasn't his blood. That was his wife's blood. And he was covered with it, head to toe. What did he do to her? Whew. Okay. So, he had taken off all her clothes, first of all. He had torn off her entire face with his bare hands. Damn, so it wasn't even his teeth. No sign of any weapon. He hadn't used a knife, nothing like that. He had gouged out her eyeballs. Yeah. He had ripped out her tongue. Damn. And then had just started tearing, like, after she was unconscious. I don't know if she was unconscious or dead or whatever. He just started digging into her face and tore her whole fucking face off with his So they don't know if that was done post-mortem or or (sighs) what, Down to the bone, they said. She was unrecognizable. So they don't know if if she did that to her after she was dead. Well, they said when they did the postmortem, they they determined that she had actually, the cause of death was uh, officially asphyxiation from her own blood. She had choked on her own blood. That's how she died. So So, he must have been tearing her apart while she was awake. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And as if that wasn't bad enough, and that's horrible enough... He had also gone after the dog, which yeah. I think was a little poodle. Yeah. He had strangled it and then tore all of its legs off. Tore, tore its arms and legs With his off. bare hands. Right, yeah. Okay. Why? Just why? The demon did it. So he did all that and he ran down the street and got arrested. Oh, what happened to him after that? God. So, yeah. So he's running down the street. What happened to him after that? Yeah. So, like I said, the cops were just like, they said they have... Obviously, they had never said, well, shit, cops like this have, cops here have never seen anything like this. What year again was this again? 1974. 74. 1974. Dang. So, obviously, they arrest Michael Taylor. They take him into custody. And um, he was still ranting and raving. It took him several hours to calm down. They finally interviewed him and were like, brah, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, what, happened? Like, what happened there? So, now he did tell them about the exorcism. Um, and the quote that I found from him was that he said, it was a long night. They danced around me and burned my cross because that was tainted with the evil. They had me in the church all night. Look at my hands. I was banging on the floor. The power was in me. I couldn't get rid of it and neither could they. They were too late. I was compelled by a force within me to destroy everything living within the house. Now, he later said that, again, he had no memory of what he had done to his wife, and he was apparently very upset about it when they told him about it because he said that he had loved his wife and hadn't wanted to do anything to hurt her. But he said that he remembered that he thought that she was possessed by a demon and so that he had to kill her to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the story that he told. Because one of his later quotes was, the evil in her has been destroyed, I'm released, it is done. Right. So it's almost like he thought she was possessed or something like that, like he had to do it. So at this stage, they're like, okay, well, this bitch crazy. So they sent him to um, a psychiatric hospital. 
And they couldn't decide, like, whether they were going to put him on trial for murder, whether they were just going to, like, slam him in an insane asylum or what. Now, they said that while he was in custody, like, awaiting, like, what they were going to do with him, they said he was either sleeping or he wouldn't talk. Um, I don't really know what happened because they had five kids. Now, apparently the five kids were either not home, they'd been sent away at the time because the kids weren't killed, they weren't in the house at the time, I guess. They didn't see any of it. Hopefully they didn't. Um, I don't know what happened to them subsequently, like how they reacted to this whole situation. But there was just like a whole like fucking, obviously this is what this tiny little town of West Yorkshire, what, you know, dude like rips his wife's face off, kills the dog and rips its legs off and shit like that. And what then they says that he didn't remember it. What they do to him? So what they did, like I said, there was a big media frenzy or whatever. Now the trial started in uh, March of 1975, and they said that basically they were trying to go for an insanity defense. Right. Because he said that he didn't remember what had happened. He was possessed by demons. He didn't evade capture or anything. No, no, no. Around. That's what I mean. He was just so walking around covered with blood. That's definitely insane. And he said, I thought she was possessed by demons, or I'm right. possessed by demons. It's like, yeah. that's why he did it. Right. So they basically... Uh, what they tried to do was that the defense, I mean, other than putting forth the the insanity defense, they were also trying to lay some of the blame on um, the kind of religious group or cult, if you want to say, that he was involved with, saying that maybe they bore part of the blame because Suggested they... What yeah, because, like, if he really did believe that he was possessed by demons and he wasn't really, then they were encouraging that belief by doing all the exorcism. So they were kind of trying to, like, you know, apportion some blame there as well. So they were trying to, like, paint it like it was a super, like, fanatical cult and maybe they had some culpability in that issue, in that uh, issue. And I think, like, one of the uh, guys that testified at the trial even called the cult, quote, neurotics, feeding neurosis to a neurotic. Okay. So that's kind of how insane they Insane people to push it. messing with an insane guy's Exactly, head. exactly. Right. So, as the trial went on, I think really the only thing, they ended up um, establishing that he was indeed insane. He didn't really seem to have any motive for what he did. He didn't seem to have much memory of it. Or if he did, he seemed to believe that it was demonically inspired. So, they ended up putting him in the infamous Broadmoor psychiatric hospital which where they usually put criminally insane people back in the day in the uk and they stuck him in there so he was not guilty by reason of insanity okay then question okay did anybody witness anything that was paranormal um psychokinesis Visions. I don't think there did were he... there was any psychokinesis okay. involved so uh, this all is... that was involved was a drastic a uh, change in personality in a very brief period okay. of time. So the courts may have been right about this one. Mm -hmm. These are crazy people acting on the minds of a crazy motherfucker yeah. who loses it. That sounds plausible. To That's me. what I mean. It seemed like he was like a nice, relatively normal yeah. dude. He was suffering from depression, but a lot yeah. of people do. It's not that unusual. They drove him crazy somehow. Do and some then he gets it. involved in this religious group, which yeah. somehow like feeds into his depression and like I mean, amps delusions it up. and stuff. And, and yeah, I do. He has feel, a psychic break. He has a mental breakdown. Yeah, I do feel like that that was probably like uh, the situation. Here. That's what it sounds like to me. So I do feel like the court probably made the right decision. Right. They put him in Broadmoor Insane Asylum because they determined he was not guilty by reason of insanity, uh, you know, legally insane. So they put him in there. Now, he was only in there for two years. Then they transferred him to another uh, psychiatric hospital for another two years. But then they let him out. So he only did four years, yeah. Now, there was a whole, like, brouhaha, like, after, because, like I said, he'd only served four years, and this was, like, a super horrific murder by any right. stretch of the imagination. Um, there was a whole controversy about the church. Actually, the exorcism that was performed on Michael Taylor was actually the last exorcism that the Anglican church ever performed. As far as I know, they haven't performed any more since then, just because of the scandal, like, surrounding this particular case, because they kind of got a little bit of the you know, backlash of, like, blamed of it, like, maybe they had something to do with him going crazy. Yeah. Um. So they didn't do exorcisms anymore after that. This is, like I said, it's not the Catholic Church, this is the Anglican Church. 
So, yeah. So he only served four years in a psychiatric hospital. Now, after they let him out, they said that he was all right and that he wasn't a danger to anyone. So he goes back to live in the same small town again. I'm not really sure how anybody like felt about that or how they reacted to it. Um, I'm not even really sure how his children reacted. There's not really a lot of information about that either. Um, now, after he went back to live in Osset, apparently he was still like kind of weird. Like people thought he acted like very odd, but not like violent, weird, like no one was scared of him or anything like that. Um, he did make several uh, suicide attempts over the ensuing years. I believe there were at least four that they know of. Um, one time he jumped off a bridge, uh, but didn't die. Uh, even though he, I think he broke his back or broke his legs or something like that or injured his back and legs. Um, another time he cut his wrists. There were a couple of other attempts. But after that, he kind of like went on the down low. There like wasn't a lot of uh, news about him. Now, in 2005, in the summer of 2005, he was arrested again. And this was for uh, sexual harassment uh, of an underage girl. Now, when he was arrested and brought to trial for this particular charge, he said to the police, quote unquote, am I going to Broadmoor for murdering my wife? Right. Even though that had been many years ago. So evidently he was in custody for about a week over this. Um, and they, while he was in custody, they noticed that like the psychiatric problems that he had like the weird behavior that he had been exhibiting prior to that, when they had tried him for the murder of his wife was starting to manifest once again, like he was starting to act like delusional. So they thought maybe they should put him back into a psychiatric hospital, but I guess they kind of assessed him and they said, well, he's at minimal risk. I mean, he was much older at this point. So they said he was a minimal, minimal risk for reoffending. So they just gave him three years community service and made him get psychiatric treatment and essentially let him kind of run around. Well, loose. they wanted to keep an eye on him. Yeah. Right. Now, as far as I know, since 2000, since his last arrest in 2005, um, he has not reoffended. He has not you know, yeah. come into the media, which you'd think that he would, like, if he did anything bad, like, you'd right. think everybody would be jumping all over that no, shit. No, that's basically the end of that case. But that's yeah. pretty much it. Like, he's pretty much, I don't even know if he's still alive at this stage. That that doesn't sound paranormal to me. That, that, that's that's That, crazy. yeah, that to me, like I said, yeah. I wanted to put these two cases like together because they case. were both, like, yeah. Well, they were both like demon possession. Yeah. That was supposedly the cause for both. But there's of them. a big difference between the two cases. That there first are, case yeah. had a lot of a, a lot of credible witnesses to it mm -hmm. of paranormal phenomenon. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of buying into that. I mean, I wasn't there; I didn't see it. But that sounds like that's a good case. Well, the fact that someone that was, you know, a board certified psychiatrist, yeah. he had studied it, and presumably, I mean, he wasn't a dummy. He had like he was a doctor. He had studied at kind of the, like the top university of the u.s and he thought that maybe there was something to this case yeah. you know yeah that, that kind of gives it a little bit more legitimacy right. because i feel like a lot of cases of quote-unquote demon possession you know the only people that are saying yeah it happened are people who have a vested interest in that being real like yeah. priests yeah is essentially you get accounts from priests and i'm not saying the priests are dummies i'm just saying that they have a vested interest in yeah. demons being real that's a good show yeah you think yeah <laughs> but yeah so you know if you're interested in the michael taylor case that was pretty some pretty fucked up shit yeah i don't know if he's still running around out there he might have died at this point he was 31 in 1974 so he probably did he might be really old or dead yeah. by now. But he really didn't come into the media anymore after 2005. So I don't know what happened to him after that. Which is kind of strange. Like, that nobody kept track of him. For all this. Especially, like, like, the British tabloid media. You'd think they'd be, like, he fell up the your asshole every fucking Now, the writers got old and then a new new bunch came in that didn't know I guess so. Yeah. But, yeah, you tear your wife's face off and I guess you uh, can get away with it if you're yeah. crazy enough. If you're crazy. <laughs> That's pretty sad. Not here. You'd be locked over the rest of your life here in the United States. Y yeah, you probably yeah. would. They would never let you out. No. Even if you were crazy, they would never yeah. let you out. They would right. put you in a psychiatric hospital. No, they'd hospital. make it worse if you were crazy. 
Well, they might put yeah. you in a psychiatric hospital, right. but they wouldn't let you out back right. out on the street. They would just leave no. you in there so you died. Yeah. I'm sure they would. All right, shut All right. Yeah. So we've gone on way long enough, yeah. uh, as we usually do. So hope, hopefully you guys uh, enjoyed episode 148 about the Julia case and the Michael Taylor exorcist murder. And remember, if you like the show, like, share, subscribe on all your social media. And if you'd like to financially sh- support the show, it would be much appreciated. You can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast. Or you can go to our blog, 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there is a little PayPal button in the sidebar where you can go to a PayPal account and give us a one-time donation if you would like to. Remember, our regular episodes come out every Tuesday, Monday, if you're a Patreon supporter. Um, Also, we have uh, movie retrospectives. They come out every Friday. And 13 o'clock matinee, which is three new movies in the theater, which we review. That comes out every Sunday, so check those out if you haven't already. And we will see you next time.